Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all uh, who are joining uh, this seminar digitally uh, from different countries, different regions of the world. And a very warm welcome to all of you who are, the, who are joining here in person in Oslo uh, for this seminar titled the uh, OECD Visibility Policy Marker, Pitfalls and Possibilities in International Development and Humanitarian Assistance. We have an exciting three hours with us. It's gonna be a long seminar, but I'm sure it'll be quite fruitful because we have excellent and eclectic speakers from different regions of the world, from Nordic countries, European Union, Nigeria, United States. We have excellent speakers. So I'm sure they will whet your appetite when it comes to this specific topic of OECD tax visibility policy marker. Why the marker is important? The marker is important because it ensures that we who work in the domain of international development or humanitarian assistance could make sure that things remain accountable. Those who give the money, they ensure that the projects which the, the money is getting, getting spent, it remains accountable. So before we talk about that uh, seminar, few notes of housekeeping. Number one, this event is getting recorded because we would want to use this for our knowledge dissemination purpose subsequently. This event is also facilitated by sign language interpreters and live captioners so that deaf individuals can follow the proceedings of this event. There's also possibilities for individuals to ask questions during the course of the event. Those who are the, in the digital audience, please, if you get the chance, if you feel that something has sparked your curiosity or interest, click on the Q&A button and ask a question and we will try to address that question or answer it to the best of our ability by the end of the session because we have a we have a time set aside for the Q&A with our panel. Also, for those audience members who are present here, there is uh, refreshments outside and we we will not have you hostage here for three hours. <laughs> there will be a break after an hour and a half which will be for 10 minutes so that you can stretch yourselves, go outside, grab a refreshment and come back in. And for the digital audience, again, it's uh, advisable to uh, take that 10 minutes time off away from the screen because whatever you might be hearing might be quite technical, quite deep and quite intensive. So take that time. So broadly speaking, the seminar is structured like this. There will be a first phase where we'll talk about how the OECD that policy marker contributes to learning and accountability. We'll have fantastic speakers in this session. After that, there'll be a break. In the second phase, we'll try to understand the opportunities in which this marker strengthens the advocacy work, disability rights advocacy work. And after that, there will be the third session wherein we'll have a Q&A as well as panel discussion. So the Q&A, all the questions which you will have, for the digital audience, please ensure that you get a chance to write those questions and the questions should be as clear, as concise, so that it's easier for us to curate those questions because we're gonna stop the Q&A chat box by 2 p.m. Oslo time, which is almost two hours from now. We'll stop that. So if you have any burning question, which you think needs to be asked, make sure that you ask that in the chat box. And for the live audience who is present here, of course, you are more than welcome uh, uh, when the panel discussion happens in the end, uh, raise your hand, introduce yourself and ask the question to the relevant panelist. So that is, that's, that's a note on housekeeping. A little bit about visual description because I am aware that there are speakers on this, uh, uh, for the seminar who are blind, as well as uh, for some part participants who might be blind. A uh, little visual description about myself. I am um, I'm wearing a black jumper, uh, dark blue, grayish uh, jacket. I have light blue shades. I have long, dark curly hair and little facial hair. And uh, yeah, and I and I hope that uh, you are able to see me or understand or visualize me. That's for the audience who cannot see uh, or are visually impaired. And 
now a little bit about the marker before we go to our first speaker. As I mentioned some moments ago, this marker is quite crucial because it ensures, brings the element of accountability, which helps in the disability rights advocacy work. And as we all know, by different estimates, there are, we, when it comes to international development aid, figures can vary from $150 billion globally to $200 billion globally. So in that big space, when there's so much money which is being spent, it's worthwhile to ask how much of that money actually goes on projects which are linked to persons with disabilities, which are ensuring that the rights of persons with disabilities and their human dignity and human freedom is supported. To understand how much of these projects are mainstream projects or specific projects uh, linked to persons with disabilities. So all these topics at some level will be addressed in the upcoming uh, discussions. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce you to Polly Meeks. Polly has uh, written a report for the Atlas Alliance, which Atlas Alliance Commission uh, concerning the OECD DAC marker, its efficacy, its, its possibilities, its promise, its challenges. And uh, Polly will be joining us from the UK is an independent consultant. Thank you very much indeed, Gagan, and thank you to the Atlas Alliance for making this work possible. So next slide, please, Rohit. In my presentation today, I'm going to be addressing a $200 billion question. As Gagan mentioned, that $200 billion is a rough representation of the amount of official development assistance, or ODA, also known as aid, that was reported by the 30 members of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's Development Assistance Committee um, last year, 2022. And the question, as Gagan also mentioned, is how far that $200 billion is aligned with the um, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Now, until um, around five years ago, it was really difficult to get any sort of quantitative sense of the answer to that question. There was um, a lot that we could do qualitatively, but getting a sort of quantitative big picture was almost impossible because the data just wasn't there. But then almost five years ago, um, the OECD DAC made um, quite a historic decision because it decided to introduce the disability policy marker to its ODA spending database. Um, and for the first time, we were then able to get some more quantitative insights. So as we approach the, the five year anniversary of that decision, um, and based on the report that, um, that I worked on with the Atlas Alliance, I'm going to share a few thoughts on um, how the marker can be a useful tool in helping shed light on disability inclusion in ODA spending where some of the key gaps are and what opportunities there may be to fill those gaps. So moving on to my next slide, please. Just to give a very quick overview of how the marker works. Basically, it works on a three point scoring system um, where each and every project that's reported to the OECD DAX central database can be given a score based on how far that project aims to promote the inclusion of persons with disabilities. So a score two means that the inclusion of persons with disabilities is the principal objective of the project. A score of one means that inclusion of persons with disabilities is a significant objective of the project, but not necessarily the main objective. So that would apply often, for example, to a disability mainstreaming type situation. A score zero means that the project does not target the inclusion of persons with disabilities in any significant way. And then finally, the marker box on the database can also be left blank because the marker is optional at the moment. So this is all um, sort of forward looking information intrinsically. The marker is capturing data about projects objectives. So obviously to get the complete picture, the marker needs to be combined also with backwards looking data on project outcomes. But for the objectives, it's a really useful tool. Then moving on to my next slide, please. I'm just going to share a couple of headlines of what the latest, um, latest marker data for, for 2021 this is, is showing us. 
Um, and I should say that all this number crunching on the data does inevitably involve methodological choices. Um, there are a few different choices that could be made. Um, for the technically minded in the audience, I should say that one of the choices I've made here is to talk about so-called allocable ODA. Um, and there's more on the background to that choice and the reasons for it in the, in the Atlas Alliance report. Um, but anyway, just to, just to share a few indicative headlines, this slide shows how far the, um, the marker was used um, by the 30 members of the OECD DAC in 2021. And it shows that for 46% of the projects, um, the allocable projects reported by those members, the marker was used. Um, but as you can see from the pie chart on the slide, um, that's still um, less than just less than half of, of, of all the allocable projects that these members were reporting. So uptake is still quite low. And then moving on to the next slide, please. This next slide talks about what's actually being reported in terms of disability inclusion. Um, and you can see there's a very thin slice on the pie chart um, representing 4%, just 4% of allocable ODA projects in 2021 were reported to be disability inclusive using the marker. So moving on to the next slide, please. That means that for over 95% of allocable ODA commitments in 2021, either there were no significant objectives on the inclusion of persons with disabilities or there's no data, 95%. So that's a really worrying result, clearly. But at the same time, this result illustrates how useful the marker can be in sounding the alarm in a sort of really concrete, quantified way. So having given that introduction on how the marker can, can be useful, I'm going to focus in the rest of my presentation on four main opportunities for how the marker could be, be strengthened further or the use of the marker could be strengthened even further to, to really realise its full potential. Um, so moving on to my next slide, please. Um, the first of these four opportunities is just making the most of the data that we already have from the marker. I'm not going to dwell on this because we're going to hear some really great presentations on different ways that people have used the data later on in this seminar. But I just wanted to flag one obstacle that's currently preventing people making the most of the data at the moment which is that the OECD's creditor reporting system database is not currently accessible for screen reader users. So those people are locked out um, of using the data, hence the image on the slide of a, of a locked door. These people are locked out um, right from the start of the process by the fact that the database isn't accessible for them. Moving on to my next slide, please. Um, the second opportunity, um, to strengthen um, the, the way that the market is used is um, related to, to known unknowns. And I have a photo of Donald Rumsfeld, the former US Secretary of Defense on the slide, because obviously he's had some rather memorable things to say about all sorts of unknowns. But in our case, we're interested in known unknowns. And those known unknowns are the, um, the amount of um, official development assistance spending that we know is, is happening, but for which we don't have any data on disability inclusion. Um, as I mentioned in my earlier slide, even looking at allocable spending reported by the 30 bilateral members of the OECD DAC, just 46% of those projects um, use the disability marker. But that's not all. Um, that, that, that analysis wasn't even including core multilateral spending. And for core multilateral spending, it's particularly hard to get, to get a real handle on, on how much of that spending is disability inclusive. Because although some multilateral organizations have their own marker system, at the moment that isn't really feeding through to the OECD DAX system. So there's a missed opportunity there. And, uh, and basically a really big missed opportunity to, to get better data on, on the, the big picture of disability inclusion within ODA. Um, one way that um, the OECD could help address this would be by making the um, disability marker mandatory rather than voluntary. Um, and that would bring the marker in line with uh, the vast majority of the, the OECD's other policy markers, like the well-known gender marker, for example, which is already mandatory. Um, moving on to my next slide, please. 
Um, the third opportunity to make more from the marker relates to data quality. So on this slide, I have an image of a magnifying glass symbolizing transparency. Um, now, this is not to say that imperfect data can't be useful. Even imperfect data can be really helpful, particularly in highlighting areas that may need improvement. Um, but obviously, the better the data quality gets, the, the better the insights that we can draw from the data are. The challenge here is that um, disability marker data is self-reported. OECD DAC members are responsible for interpreting the OECD's guidance themselves, and some may report it in a more interpret it in a more generous way than others. So moving on to my next slide. I won't dwell on the details of this, but the full details are in the report. But basically, this is a scatter chart where I've tried to compare in, in a, a rough way um, the quantitative marker scores that are being reported by um, a sample of 10 OECD DAC members with um, qualitative data on those members' policies and processes for inclusion of persons with disabilities. Um, and generally, you'd expect that there would be a correlation and that um, the, the better the policies and processes were, the higher the percentage of ODA that was reported as disability inclusive would be. And to an extent, you do tend to see that correlation in, in the DAC members that I've, I've looked at here. But at the same time, there's also some noise in, in that pattern. And um, in particular, there's one outlier, one apparent anomaly. Um, you'd need a lot more information to understand why that anomaly was there. There could be all sorts of reasons for it, um, but it's, it's an indication that perhaps um, there, there could be differences in, um, in how different OECD DAC members interpret um, the guidance on the marker and that perhaps um, some members who have weaker policies and processes are maybe interpreting the guidance in a more generous way than, than others are. The best way to get to the bottom of this, of course, is to look um, not just at the big picture, but at individual projects that have been reported as disability inclusive and see whether those projects are really living up to standards on disability inclusion. And some of our later speakers, um, in particular Annika, have, have done some really interesting work on, on that. Um, so um, it'll be really interesting to hear a bit more about that later on. Moving on to my next slide, please. Um, this slide include, um, uh, includes a, a photo of a sticker saying every human has rights. And that's because whereas in the previous, um, previous points that I've been making, I've been looking more at the implementation of the disability marker as it stands. Um, in my final point, I'd like to think more about the design of the marker and how far the design of the marker and the accompanying guidance reflects um, the rigor of the, of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, there's um, a diversity of opinions and views on this and on how the marker could be strengthened, and we'll be hearing a lot about this later on. I'd also like to acknowledge really helpful discussions I've had on this with Hannah, who's speaking later on. Um, but in what I'm going to say now, I'll be guided by the call for action that was issued by the International Disability and Alliance, the International Disability Alliance and Allies um, in 2019. So moving on to my next slide, please. The, the call for action called for um, the marker's guidance to align with the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, to promote the meaningful involvement of persons with disabilities and their representative organizations and to include an expectation that all interventions assess whether they meet the criteria of doing no harm. Based on this, I'd like to highlight two main basic ways in which the marker's guidance could be strengthened um, for better alignment with the CRPD. This isn't exhaustive, but it's just a couple of initial steps that would help. First um, would be making do no harm, a uh, basic requirement for absolutely all interventions that are screened using the marker, even interventions that are given a score of zero. That would align the marker better with the OECD's existing gender marker. And the second recommendation would be requiring that all projects 
um, that are reported as disability inclusive should have to um, actively involve persons with disabilities and their representative organisations in line with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Next slide, please. There's more detail on all of the points that I've been making today in the report that, um, that I recently worked on with the Atlas Alliance, which is on the Atlas Alliance's um, reports page. Um, so just to finish, coming back to that $200 billion question that I raised at the beginning of the, of the talk, um, definitely the disability market can offer really important insights towards answering that question. But there's still more that could be done. And $200 billion, that represents such an important potential resource for helping to uphold the rights of persons with disabilities. It's really essential that we do have the best possible transparency over it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Polly, for that thoughtful uh, presentation. Um, one thing which kind of uh, uh, was uh, very evident in your presentation that uh, you, you mentioned something about the data and uh, how data is so crucial for framing policies, which are which are few, which are grounded in facts. And uh, even if we have imperfect data with cautious interpretation, we can use that data for advocacy purposes. So that is a very important uh, lesson. And there's a lot of work which has to be done when it comes to collecting that this data uh, on the OECD DAC policy marker. So now uh, from Polly uh, in the UK, we will go to, since the, uh, the title of this uh, uh, seminar is OECD DAC, uh, policy, disability policy marker, who better than to listen from an OECD expert. Let's uh, welcome Giorgio Galbati. Giorgio is a statistical analyst working with OECD, and he will tell us more about data and how data should be or could be used, the latest data on the OECD DAC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me at this uh, webinar. So my name is uh, Giorgio Galberti. I'm a 48 year old man, I'm totally bald, and uh, I have uh, red glasses, a very oval uh, uh, face, I have a goatee and a blue sweater. And uh, I am uh, responsible for the OECD of um, following the uh, policy markers, and I also followed the uh, introduction of the a policy marker on support and inclusion to persons with disabilities and of the uh, handbook for reporters to uh, guide the reporting of this policy mark. So uh, as uh, Polly said, this was introduced a few years ago, I mean, in a dialogue with the, between the DAC members and civil society organizations. It is linked with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and has the same methodologies as other markers. It's voluntary reporting, of course, and, uh, and as everything, it can be changed, but in, to, to, to be changed, all these things need the consensus uh, among, uh, among members. I mean, the, the, the role of advocacy, the, your role is, is super important to strengthen the consensus and the reporting of this policy marker. What I'm doing uh, uh, today is giving you some data. Given that we talked about data, we, we look a little bit at what we find uh, in the latest 2021 data of the uh, policy marker on uh, support to persons with disabilities. So first of all, we have uh, uh, here a chart with four years, and we see that the reporting increased and particularly in uh, the latest uh, 2021 uh, data, it reached uh, uh, over 15 billion of dollars of uh, commitments that are uh, with the uh, disability market. Almost all these commitments are uh, significant. That means that there is a uh, objective that is included. Disability concerns are somehow included in the um, in the project but they are not the principal uh, motive they, 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 there are around 500 million dollars in 2021 of disability related ODA from uh, uh, DAC members that have a principal objective of uh, supporting uh, people with disabilities so the the, the the significant part grew considerably from 2018, uh, 1920, and to 2021. We say that 
we 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 see several billions more in uh, in uh, 2021. Now I go to my next slide and I have a look at the uh, at the USD commitment by donor. And here we use uh, uh, an average of the data from 2020 to 2021. So to smooth a little bit the, the data. So the first um, donor in terms of dollar amount were the uh, European Union institutions and uh, with more than $5 billion dollars followed by uh, Japan uh, with more than 3.5 billion dollars and then uh, the United Kingdom more than 1 billion dollars and then all the others which are Canada, Australia, Sweden, Norway, Ireland, Italy, Finland, Switzerland and, and several others. And uh, uh, in total we had um, 23 uh, duck donors plus Monaco that reported data in 2021 and uh, uh, the first three donors in terms of, uh, of amount so European Union, Japan and the United Kingdom <coughs> sorry they account for more than 81 percent of the total so I'm going now on the next slides to look a little bit of what are the the sectors that are uh, have uh, largest disability related commitments in 2020-2021. And these were uh, transport, health, uh, emergency support, uh, government and civil society and education. So the thing that is very, very important here, I think is this very uh, huge amount of activity in transport that is uh, on average more than 2.5 billion uh, dollars, which are uh, completely uh, significant. That means that there were some uh, transport activities, very large transport activities that uh, were uh, indicated as disability accessible and, and reported in this way. While uh, for other sectors, like for example, health or uh, education or government and civil society that includes social security, there are activities that are uh, considered as principal for, for supporting uh, disability. I'm now going to my uh, next slide and uh, uh, we look a little bit uh, at the, the, the most important uh, recipient. And what we found in this, uh, in this looking at the recipient, uh, it's interesting because we, we see that uh, disability related ODA is really spread among a wide among a wide number of uh, of recipient countries and uh, the first one are uh, uh, India followed by Bangladesh and then Africa regional Indonesia south of Sahara regional Turkey Syria Ethiopia and Tanzania so these are, and of course, a bilateral unspecified, that is uh, when, when you have uh, activities that have no specific geographical focus. So if we take into account the first 10 uh, recipient, these account for uh, around half, 53% of the total. Uh, while in total we have uh, 165 recipients. I mean, this includes also uh, countries and regional areas. What does it mean? It means that for this uh, marker, uh, this is really widespread. It's not concentrated in few countries, but uh, but touches a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, everywhere in the world where ODA is uh, committed. <clears throat> and then I go to my uh, last slide. And uh, I, uh, I had a quick look, I mean, uh, at, the, at the largest projects. I, I, I was curious uh, to, to see what, uh, what are, and I mean, uh, and how concentrated is the finance in few large projects. And so what I, what I found uh, is that if, I take, if we take into account the, the largest 10 projects, uh, whatever the objective, we have the, this amount for a very large amount uh, of disability related ODA. It's actually the top 10 projects are 39% of the 
of the uh, total for 2021. And these are all significant projects. So what are these? There are four transport projects so with mass transport system and transport infrastructure. There are three health projects, but these three health projects are only for COVID-19. So it's big COVID-19 projects that of course also include persons with disabilities. Then there are some energy infrastructure, disaster prevention and communication and so on. And uh, so I wanted to have a look at the largest principal project. They're much smaller in amount. I mean, the, we, we talk from billions to millions of dollars. And the largest are uh, in the sector, in multi-sector health or uh, education. However, I have to say that, I mean, it was a very quick look, eh? I have to say, but disability is not always, in some of them is explicitly declared in the title, uh, but in some others uh, were a little bit more uh, difficult to understand if this was a uh, really, really target uh, uh, disability as a principal objective. It's when the descrip descriptions in the title are not very clear, it's, uh, it's difficult for analysts and also, of course, also for the secretariat to, to, um, to assess this. And, uh, and this was my presentation. I just want to tell uh, if I have 50 more seconds, I just want to, uh, maybe we can discuss later. So on that accessibility, we will have, uh, I know I already promised this, but we will have a new, uh, um, a new system uh, that should be really in place before, before summer, because it's in pre-production and, and it will go in production in one week or so. And uh, on um, the fact, that, I mean, there are a lot of questions that Polly made, so maybe later we can discuss uh, all of them. I don't want to go uh, after to, to, to prolong my time more than uh, what was allocated. So uh, I invite you to make questions and thank you again for the opportunity of uh, uh, speaking to you today. Hope to be there uh, in person the next time. Thank you very much. Robert, you, uh, we really appreciate the fact that you are keeping to the time and you and you take this time uh, deadlines uh, to be sacrosanct for us. This is very, very cruel, crucial because we have so many speakers and we would like to hear from all of you and you all have such fantastic insights. But one thing which is uh, jumping out to me uh, from your presentation was this question of accessibility and transport accessibility is so crucial according to the Article 9 of the UNCRPD, which talks about building systems which are accessible. And also what Polly mentioned in her presentation, perhaps when now you are testing your OECD uh, systems and if they're not accessible for data retrieval for blind users or users who use uh, um, screen readers, it'll be fantastic to have that system as well in place. So thank you once again, Giorgio. And now moving on from Giorgio OECD representation to uh, Daryl Lloyd from the UK, Foreign Commonwealth Development Office. Uh, Daryl will be giving a, a, a deep insight into the UK's role with regards to the OECD marker, as well as uh, what are its utilities. Daryl, take it away. Uh, so, thank you very much, Gagan, uh, for introducing me. Um, Daryl Lloyd, I'll just, just give us a quick description. I'm a, a white middle-aged male. Um, I have black hair, which is actually mostly gray these days. I'm wearing glasses <laughs> and a white shirt. And I have a UK aid background um, on, on Zoom, which blends very badly with my grey hair and, and white shirt. So I have to recon reconsider that in the future. Um, so I was just going to talk a little bit about where we came from in the UK and using the marker and why we wanted to, to bring it in. So next slide, please. Um, so very much the first question is what? Why did we think we needed it? Well. We were going into go back to step back to 2017. We were planning the first global disability summit, which we hosted in London um, in 2018. When we were planning that. So we very much realised that we didn't really know ourselves, how have any sense of what portion of our our ODA programmes were undertaking disability inclusive work. We had no way of monitoring change, no way of tracking whether we were getting better, and we had very few routes to try and prompt our program teams to start thinking about what activities they could do. So they all knew the, the summit was coming along, but it was quite a, an isolated topic. It's like most of, we were differed back then, Department for International Development, most program teams weren't thinking about disability inclusion. So 
one way of thinking about kind of the change their attitudes and think about what they actually could do was to think about how do we track how do we how do we figure out what's going on um so next slide please and so they were thinking why why was a marker the right way of doing things um well we needed something that was low burden because if we put something complex in place program teams just wouldn't want to engage and we needed something to uh, integrate within our our management information system it's called amp um which my mind suddenly gone blank what that means aid management at the age management platform um so we need something integrated into that automatically but we had a model to work off uh, and and jojo has already mentioned this he's and i think penny did as well that the gender equality marker firmly existed at that point it was being well used uh well respected there was a handbook had been developed for it so we very much have the attitude of why why reinvent a wheel? Why start from scratch when there's a working model there? Um, next slide, please. Um, but when we kind of step back then, there was nothing at the, at the DAC, DAC marker. So we decided that irrespective of what was going on internationally, we would develop our own marker and use it for international purposes. Um, we wanted to kind of drive that global leadership in terms of with the, the summits coming up. Um, and we recognise there was a real value in having a unified system, though. We, we, we thought it was much better to have something internationally. So we worked jointly with the DAC to, to try and bring that in. And we were very, very glad that other member states wanted us as well, and, and, the, and it was introduced. And actually, one thing we should reflect on, and Giorgio didn't mention it, he, he mentioned the handbook briefly, but he was um, critical in development of that handbook. And that makes a big difference now in how, com how countries, member states are using it. Next slide, please. So we have thought very much about, well, how do we integrate it in our system? How do we make it simple for people to do? How do we get program teams to focus on the information they need to record? Um, next slide, please. So we put it into the, our system. And I'll just take you almost through what the screens we get. So this is this image here is, is a, for those of you who aren't able to see it, it's a, a website um, which runs internally in SCDO, and it asks, holds information about each ODA program we have and on it we have screens for each of the policy markers so the gender equality disability inclusion the rio markers all about environment ones and then some other markers um, next slide please when we go into the disability inclusion screen we basically get a pop-up which asks them is this a principal program significant or will not address so that equates to the two the one and the zero that polly was talking about earlier um, but we also try and put more information on there about trying to explain what we mean so that we can prompt people to start thinking properly about how to fill it in. It doesn't go as far as the handbook itself. I mean, the handbook is much more detailed, but it's trying to capture the essence of what we mean by principle and what we mean by significance. Um, next slide, please. The one other thing, thing we also try and capture, and this has not been so successful, is a question of what portion of budget we think is being spent on disability inclusion. So Giorgio has just shown us some great slides about the total work value of all the projects which are disability inclusive in some way. But those many billions of pounds he spoke about, we have to remember that most of that isn't going to disability, only a small portion is. Um, so whilst there may be, say, a $300 billion project which has been marked as being one so as, as being significant it may only be that five percent ten percent two percent of that budget is actually for disability inclusive work um so we try to try we try to think about how do we get more information about that so we actually ask our program teams about what proportion of budget they think and actually this is really difficult um and it's very hard for them to estimate next slide please and why it's and this is kind of where we get into the challenge of culture. So it's very easy to collect this information technologically. You could ask for it, but it's quite hard to make them change their mindsets uh, about what's recorded. So next slide, please. So trying to get them to think about what get that information down. So we kind of use a stick and carrot approach. Um, we force them to say, well, you can't enter a program on our system without putting a marker down, uh, and we assess for compliance. But that doesn't help them decide on what right approach is. So we have to put alongside that um, support training on how to make their programs disability inclusive. So we have, for instance, a help desk 
where they can go and get um, business cases reviewed and ask about technical input. So we kind of help help try and help them along, along with that. Next slide, please. And that leads us to the question of what difference is it making? So anecdotally, we're very much seeing that some teams treat this as a tick box exercise. Um, they just want to tick something to be, make sure they're compliant with the rule that they have to have something on there. That doesn't always mean they're thinking properly about how to make program stability inclusive or whether the program really is. Um, so we have to work better at making them think that through the cycle. But there's also been cases where things change over time. Um, so they thought they would do something about the disability inclusion, but that didn't happen. They got program cuts or there was a change of direction or the other way around where they got some new advisors in who said, actually, it's education program. We can make it an inclusive education program much better instead. Um, so we have seen things change. And I think one of the problems or challenges of the marker is getting people to keep their data up to date. You have a five year long project, you set it at the beginning often, and then forget about it for the next five years. Yes, over those five years, there could be many changes and approaches and attitudes uh, and what's being done. And if, unless you're keeping the data up to date, we don't really know what's going on there. Um, next slide, please. So just kind of thinking about where to go to uh, and, and how to, how to move things along. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, that, there was a, yeah. Uh, yes, I've got to mention there before we get to the next slide that we are using that information to monitor how we're performing against our strategies. Um, are we getting things, are we getting things better? So next slide, please. So there are advantages um, in building the, in, in, into administrative systems. Program teams have control. They, they, they can look at things themselves. You can include guidance and instruction on there, and it offers the opportunities to review markers and track progress. But there are some improvements that can be made from our side, and I think how we approach it. Next slide, please. And ultimately, it's not, e it's still not easy to force teams to document the, the activities they're undertaking, and that is a requirement under the handbook. Uh, so that's quite a challenge to make that follow through. And uh, Lex, bullet point, please. That's my, my final one. Um, the other thing I reflect on is the word significant is actually quite tricky. Significant to most people means a lot is happening. We're doing quite a big chunk of disability inclusion work. But in practice, as I said before, it may only be a very small proportion. And there is a communication thing about trying to explain what significant means. So we do need to think about that. Thank you very much, and I'll hand you back over again. Thank you so very much, uh, Dal, for that thought-provoking um, uh, presentation, and specifically um, uh, raising this issue about changing the mindset, because often uh, uh, we could be stuck with the tick box mentality instead of seeing that this that this marker is crucial for tracking where the money is being spent, how it's being spent, and can help in enhancing the overall, overall performance of the project and the uh, and the uptake. So thank you for, for mentioning that. And the question of significance, gosh, uh, you have opened, uh, if I dare so, a can of worms, <laughs> which we will address uh, subsequently in the, in the next half. And many people will talk about it and discuss it, uh, what significant is uh, uh, in projects. So from the UK, now we'll take a digital transatlantic flight to the East Coast, New York, United States. Our next speaker is Gopal Mitra. Uh, from Global Lead on Disability from UNICEF. And UNICEF gets a lot of funding from NURAD and does phenomenal work when it comes to inclusive education and the rest. So Gopal, the floor is yours. Please uh, enlighten us about your system, uh, which is a bit different from the OECD DAC marker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gagan. And thanks to Atlas Alliance and, and uh, other organizations uh, uh, organizing this uh, uh, seminar and for giving us an opportunity to share some of our experiences and reflections. Um, and uh, uh, as many of you know, uh, disability inclusion is not new to UNICEF. Starting uh, from the uh, coming into force of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, late 80s, uh, UNICEF has been in many ways trying to address uh, the rights of, of children with disabilities. But over the last, uh, five or seven years, we have seen the work becoming more systematic. Uh, 
in February this year, UNICEF launched its first comprehensive disability inclusion policy and strategy, which primarily aims uh, to accelerate and scale up disability inclusion across our programs and internal corporate processes. And one, uh, UNICEF, uh, through this policy and strategy, has made seven bold commitments on disability inclusion. And one of the commitment is to invest significantly more on disability inclusion, aiming to reach a 10% of its annual budget uh, by 2030 to achieve disability inclusion. Now, in a large uh, mainstream uh, agency like UNICEF, uh, it is very interesting how you track disability inclusion, how you report disability inclusion. And as uh, many of you know, uh, the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy, which was uh, launched by the Secretary General in 2019, also has one of its benchmarks uh, of tracking a resource allocation to disability inclusion. So that also, I think, uh, added to the momentum of being able to measure results, measure our spending, and principally aiming to do better and be more systematic uh, on disability inclusion. Uh, now at UNICEF, and uh, let me pause here and say that uh, Gagan, you mentioned about the, uh, the partnership with Norway, with NORAD, and uh, the, the Norway UNICEF partnership on disability inclusion helped us immensely to develop this strategy, but also more significantly to strengthen our institutional capacity. And I'll come back to it later, because what we find essentially is there is a gap between our intent and capacity, right? And that applies to when we are talking about uh, tracking expenditure or resources being allocated to disability inclusion. And that seems to be the most um, uh, 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 I mean, persistent uh, bottleneck, right? We can have the best tools, best systems, best guidance, but at the end of the day, it is our colleagues around the world, it is our partners to, uh, who, who report and from whom we get the data, right? So there is a, there is a continuous need of, of developing that capacity if we want to have meaningful data uh, on a host of things and, uh, and including um, uh, uh, tracking of uh, resource allocation to disability inclusion. Now at UNICEF, as I mentioned, large multilateral agency, mainstream, uh, how, do you, how do you track and report? So at this point, we report disability inclusion through the executive director's annual report, which among other things also include disability inclusion, the annual results report, uh, which has data, uh, uh, data compendium, uh, and of course, uh, through a country office annual reports. That's the reporting part. In terms of measuring, uh, our current strategic plan has 34 indicators, which are specific to disability inclusion, or in most cases, disaggregate data by disability. So from that, we know, for example, in 2022, UNICEF reached 4.5 million children with disabilities. But, uh, and this is uh, what I'm going to say now is also directly related uh, uh, to, uh, to measuring expenditure and, and the impact that it has, is that reaching children with disabilities directly is only one part of our story on disability inclusion. Because UNICEF uh, spends considerable energy on supporting governments on system strengthening, building up its data systems, assessment systems, right? Uh, technical support, policy support, capacity building. These directly do not uh, uh, convert in, in the immediate run on more reaching more children with disabilities, but have a foundational impact on disability inclusion. And often these system strengthening part costs far less than directly reaching children with disabilities. That's what our data show. Now, what data is it? And how do you measure it? Currently, we may, uh, our program information database has a disability tag. It's a little different from a marker because the disability tag is applied at the activity level. It is mandatory and it has been there since 2018 uh, when our previous strategic plan, 2018-2021, came into force. Now, uh, apart from the disability tag, 
which is applied at the activity level. And, uh, and it, because it's the activity level, it helps us to get more accuracy and more granularity. Because once you come to the outcome or the output levels, as was just mentioned, what significant is, what uh, principle, principle, okay, there is uh, less ambiguity. Uh, there, is, uh, there tends to be a lot of ambiguity, right? And how you apply. Uh, so it's the disability tag at the activity level, it's mandatory. And apart from that, we have specific intervention codes, which are which, uh, 12 of them in this strategic plan, which deals with uh, the most common uh, expenditures related to disability. For example, procurement of assistive devices and products, uh, remodeling of uh, rehabilitation of uh, public infrastructure like schools, health facilities, and so on. Uh, supporting uh, uh, governments on enhancing or strengthening disability data, uh, putting into place cash transfer for children with disabilities, right? Uh, and so on. So most common uh, specific uh, interventions related to children with disabilities so through the combination of both of them that we measure allocation of resources. Now, coming back to the tag, the tag, there are four levels. Principal, as Polly just mentioned, uh, where the principal focus of that activity is to promote disability inclusion. It is significant, where a significant uh, focus is there uh, uh, on disability inclusion. Marginal, where some actions have been taken, uh, but it is not uh, is significant. And zero, uh, that is, uh, uh, I mean, no conscious measure has been taken to include children with disabilities or to promote disability inclusion. Now, essentially what we see, what we are trying to measure is the intentionality with which disability inclusion has been addressed. If you do not do anything in your programs, you know, or your activities, some children with disabilities uh, may be included or are included generally. But what we are trying to measure is the intentionality with which disability inclusion has been addressed. Now, let me give you an examples of, of uh, from our data systems reporting from last year, um, where it has been tagged as principal or significant or marginal. Uh, for example, in uh, uh, Cambodia, UNICEF supported the Ministry of Social Welfare and uh, Rehabilitation to undertake countrywide a large scale disability identification and assessment. It, it provided tools uh, for identification uh, it set up the data disability data information management system, uh, which uh, more than 250 people with disabilities uh, were identified for further verification and issue of identity cards. This is principle because the focus was on disability inclusion. Uh, another example, for example, uh, in, in Dominican Republic, a joint program on disability inclusion specifically were uh, focused on strengthening uh, education of children with disabilities and strengthening education, inclusive education through a host of activities, right? And then also focusing on the transition from learning to employment. These are tagged as principal. Now, significant, how uh, some examples. Uh, in, in Indonesia, for example, post COVID-19 uh, studies showed that disability was one of the significant factors uh, risking dropout of, of children particularly children with disabilities, among others. It was recognized or identified as a significant uh, 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 risk. So in Indonesia, the, the education program, among other groups, also took concrete steps to target children with disabilities, uh, providing scholarships, provisioning of accessible learning materials, and so on. Similarly, in Lebanon, UNICEF, along with ILO, uh, led the advocacy on establishing a social grant, social grant uh, uh, to strengthen social assistance. There was a child, uh, 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 child grant, disability allowance, and so on. So disability was a significant part of it, but not the only part, right? That these are significant. Uh, uh, similarly, in, in, in marginal, uh, for example, whole of community-based programs or approaches, where even if you consider disability, it will never be significant. Whole of community programs where 
uh, steps have been taken, intentional steps have been taken to include disability uh, are, are tagged as marginal, where no, no conscious steps have been taken, it's zero. So that's how we, we are trying to uh, uh, assess. Now, as I said, system strengthening is something where the cost, the expenditures are less, but the, uh, the results are more foundational. Now, before I end, there is one point I want to mention. It is the issue of capacity. Unless we build the capacity of our staff across, organization, across the organization, uh, we will not be able to get quality data and in the next strategic plan, we'll also see instead of a tag, if a marker is required. And one point, uh, we have often seen uh, the issue of prevention not being tagged as significant or principal or anything. Now, we have also seen programs, for example, in polio, where it is the prevention of disability, but children with disabilities are being targeted. There's a lot of efforts being taken to target children with disabilities to get polio vaccines. And also have children, young people, and persons with disabilities in polio campaigns to reduce the stigma. You know, so in these instances, that's a question for reflection and discussion. Should it be marginal, or should we should these type of expenditure, though it's prevention, but children with disabilities are being included, and specific steps are being taken, uh, should they not be marked for disability inclusion? So these are some of the reflections that we have. Uh, and thanks once again for this interesting seminar and lo look forward to the discussions. My colleague Jasmina will be available. She works on the tag and on the planning and will be happy to answer questions as I will not be there at the end when the, during the Q&A session. Thanks and back to you, uh, Gagan. Thank you, uh, Gopal, for that uh, insightful and erudite uh, comments about uh, intentionality. That's, uh, that's really crucial. Uh, it reminded me of the concept of positive externality in economics, which is used that uh, sometimes we have uh, good positive unintended outcomes with, because it, be, because we are just implementing the project. So what you mentioned about uh, children with disabilities just being included by the fact that there's a project happening in that village uh, is, is a good example. So in, focus on intentionality is crucial <clears throat> and your uh, question in the end is quite thought provoking. I hope we get a chance to address that or discuss about that, about the prevention issue. So now from uh, Gopal on the East Coast in the United States, we come back to Norway again, closer at home, uh, and listen to uh, Ragnil Vognil. Ragnil is a senior advisor uh, at Nura. that she works in the section of human rights and has been quite instrumental in liaisoning uh, with us at the Atlas Alliance, fought together for inclusion agreement and the other agreements we have. Ragnil, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Gagan, uh, for your kind introduction. And thank you, Atlas, for hosting this event and for giving Nura the opportunity to speak here, to participate and to learn from the other speakers. And thank you, Polly, for your report. It's very interesting, for sure. Uh, so my name is Ragnil, and just a quick description. I'm 30-year-old female, brown, shoulder long hair. I'm wearing today a black suit jacket over a flower printed blouse, it's a little tribute to spring. <laughs> and I will speak today about Norway uh, Norwegian Development Corporation and our use of an experience with, with what we call for short, uh, the disability marker. And uh, next please. So uh, the presentation today will have two parts. Uh, I will start uh, with the, presenting the statistics from 2018 until 2022. And then second, I will talk about some of the challenges and opportunities that we see with the disability marker from Norad's uh, perspective. Uh, next, please. So starting with the statistics, um, I can just say first that Norad and Norway supported the introduction of the disability marker since its beginning. And we stu started to use it back when it was launched in uh, 2018. Uh, so we have, we have data going back to 2018. And I'm also very happy that I can present the 2022 data for you today. It was launched just last week, so it's fresh uh, fresh off the press. So the first um, slide shows the total numbers and shares. Uh, and the dark green column on the left shows the total amount of Norwegian kroners that go to projects marked with a disability marker as a main objective. And the light green shows the same, uh, but for projects marked with a disability marker as a significant objective. And as you can see, efforts where inclusion is a main objective has increased quite 
steadily from 2018, where it was 124 million, to 2020, where it was 517 million. That was kind of the peak year. And since then, there have been a slight decrease. Uh, in 2022, it was 392 million uh, spent on projects with disability as main objective. When it comes to um, significant, we can see a steady increase from 2018 until uh, today. From 430 million in 2018, 1 billion in 2021, and 1.37 billion in 2022. And this is an increase we're very happy to see and that we're working for, and we hope we'll see increase in the years going forward as well. And this is, uh, uh, yeah, and when you look at the percentage wise, uh, you see the line kind of hovering about the, these, uh, above these columns. You can see the total share of Norwegian airmarked aid used on projects marked with disability marker, both main and significant combined. So here the core support is excluded. excluded. And also here we see an increase from 2018 to 2020. Uh, it went from 2.5% to just under 5%. And then the last three years, this percentage has been uh, more or less the same, kind of laying just under 5%. Um, no increase, unfortunately. Next, please. <clears throat> Moving on to the different target areas, uh, we can see that the education sector is the area where we spend most on project marked with disability marker. Here, both significant and main are combined in the same horizontal columns. And you have it uh, over the different years from 2018 until today. So you see a steady increase in education sector from 2018 until today in 2022, where it's 684 uh, million. And this has been a sector where our partners in Norway and Nordal have worked well with disability inclusion over several years. And this can kind of be reflected in the statistics. And we're also glad to see an increase uh, in projects marked disability within emergency assistance. It bypassed 400 million uh, in 2022. It was just under 300 million in 2021. And this is um, one reason for this increase is a large project with the International Organization for Migration in Ukraine. It's, it contributes significantly to this increase. Uh, health and social service, we also saw an increase from 2021 to 2022. Uh, and unfortunately, in inclusive spending within governance, civil society, and conflict prevention, the Include the money spent on inclusion there, um, project marked with significant domain has decreased. Next, please. And the next that uh, is our partners. Uh, so the Norwegian NGOs have been since 2018 our biggest group of partners uh, with, uh, for disability inclusion. Uh, and they've also received um, they received more funding in 2022 than 2018 for sure, but uh, it's been, a, been, a, been an increase over the years. 730 million in 2022 and Atlas Alliance is the biggest recipient in this group. The second large partner group we see is the multilateral institutions. Uh, and in 2022, they received around 685 million kroners uh, marked with the marker. And this includes the project previously mentioned from the International Migration Organization, multi partner trust funds, a UN office for disaster risk reduction, and UNICEF, to mention some. And the third largest recipient group is governments and ministries in developing countries, and international NGOs in, is the fourth. So when zooming in on the partners, uh, UNICEF is the partner that received the most funding marked with the marker. Uh, and this includes the disability partnership that uh, um, Mr. Mitra mentioned, which you see is this, like the little green uh, part all the way at the beginning of that column. And the rest are different projects we have with UNICEF, um, including Education Cannot Wait and other country specific agreements. And of course, core support is not included there. And our second largest partner is uh, the Atlas Alliance. And Save the Children, Norway is the third. Next, please. Then moving on to geography, um, Africa receives 52% of our development cooperation mark with the disability marker. 
America 3%, Europe 7%, and the Middle East 9%, and Asia 12%. And 17% is not geographically allocated. And zooming in on the different countries, Tanzania, Somalia, and Ukraine are those receiving uh, the, the three largest receivers of development cooperation market at the marker. So the geographical spread, you could say it reflects the recipient uh, country, the countries that are our partners in development cooperation. And if we just look a bit further into two of these countries, for example, Tanzania, the total aid to Tanzania in 2022 was 450 million and 150 million of this was utilized, utilized the marker. So that is not too bad, it's, it's 33%. However, looking at Ukraine uh, that's received over 5 billion in 2022, where only 100 and 113 million was um, marked with the marker, it shows that there is potential to do better there. So next, please. So I'll use the last two minutes on challenges, limitations, and opportunities. Uh, and I could just say, we. I, I read your report, Polly, and, and many of your findings did resonate uh, with us and our experience as, as branch managers and, and users of, of, of this uh, marker. And to start with the criteria of use, um, we do also find that the disability marker is kind of less clear for grant managers compared to the of the gender marker, for instance, that has very, it has listed five criteria that must be met in order to apply the um, marker. And just to Daryl's uh, thoughts about the word significance, we can we share them from Norway. It's a bit fussy term, uh, and which leaves a bit room for interpretation and enhances the risk of incorrect use. And we have to acknowledge that their incorrect uh, use, inaccurate, inaccurate use, do occur, um, despite thorough quality assurance every year before we publish the data. And uh, Polish report also referred to these errors uh, when discussing the mapping and the evaluation of Norwegian Development Corporation from 2020, uh, 2010 to 2020 that Annika Nilsson did and that she will talk about, I'm sure, later today. Uh, but she did find several projects being marked wrongly when she really scrutinized uh, our use of the marker. Because because of this evaluation, because of Norway's commitment to enhancing the data, uh, we are, which is also a significant part of our strategy, uh, equality for all, uh, which is a strategy for us to strengthen disability inclusion and development cooperation. We are working to enhance the data, the quality of our data. Um, we will, for instance, make an internal guideline for how to use Oh, my time is out so quickly. <laughs> I'm sorry. And uh, if you can give me just 30 seconds, I'll just run through yeah. the, the other ones. Uh, yeah, it's important to remember that the marker shows intention of results. Uh, and um, this with project description that was also mentioned earlier in this presentation, we do, we do share that, that it's challenging to make good project descriptions that make it possible for others to pull to share our data. If you can just go to the last slide, opportunities and strengths, we see that the market definitely give us insights, um, especially when coupled with other um, information such as geography, sector, development over time. It can be used of learning and our evaluation is one example of that. It can be used to tracking, keep us accountable uh, on our implementation of the, our equality for all strategy, for instance. This marker will show if you succeed in, in mainstreaming uh, disability inclusion across different sectors and it's used in policy uh, development and it's actively used in Norway by ATAS Alliance and others when lobbying and talking to our politicians. It's used by NORAD when we give advice to the ministry so uh, it, our politicians are well aware of this marker so we are it's definitely being used for policy development. All right. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ragni, for that um, for laying down the whole landscape with regards to Norway's uh, understanding of the marker, its implementation, and, and its utility for for the Norwegian audience. Uh, it's quite crucial what you mentioned that we have data, which is uh, you said it came fresh off the press last week, and Daryl mentioned to the point about you know updating the data and also uh, this concept of you know uh, when we look at this data we should look at it or understand it or interpret it with a grain of salt, since there are, there are challenges with uh, how it is interpreted at the grassroots uh, when, when the data is being collected. So thank you for that. Now we'll have like uh, four 
set of presentations, which will be relatively speaking shorter presentations. Uh, so we'll start we'll start with uh, Marion Steff from the European Disability Forum. Uh, Marion works as an international uh, cooperation manager. Uh, Marion, would you like to reflect on some of the projects which you have been doing? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gavin. Uh, and thank you for the Atlas Alliance to invite EDF at this uh, very interesting event. Um, so in terms of uh, presentation about myself, I'm not going to say my age, uh, but I feel like I'm 20, but I'm not 20. And I've got lots of energy <laughs> and I've got a blue jumper, a blue jacket and blue glasses. So I guess uh, I like blue. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to be here, like I said. Um, and I want just, I'm coming from another perspective. I'm coming from um, um, the European Disability Forum, which is an organization of persons with disabilities. We've got an, about a number of members, and then mostly they are organization of persons with disabilities, DPOs. So uh, we work on what, we monitor the work of the EU within Europe, what they're doing to advance the rights of persons with disabilities. But we also monitor the work that the EU is doing in international cooperation and humanitarian action. So I see my time has been reduced by one minute. <laughs> so I'm gonna go um, directly to the work we've been doing for the past few years, because we have also a mandate to really support our DPOs uh, to showcase the latest trends, the new topics, et cetera, the new tool that exists. And the OECD DAC marker is one of them. So in May 2020, we published a report to really explain to DPOs what are the DAC marker, what is the Discipline Development Assistance Committee, what is the marker, how does it work, uh, what are the different scores, the aim of the marker, its limitation, etc. Then in 2021, what we have done is really monitor the work of the EU and the EU member state. So what we wanted to do is to map the disability inclusiveness of European member states um, in development and humanitarian aid. So we focus on Denmark, the European Union, Finland, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Norway, Spain, Sweden, and of course the United Kingdom. We had different themes uh, organizing to like strategy and leadership, engagement with DPO, internal capacity, etc., and also spending. So for spending, among other points, we use the total official development assistance, ODA, spending, as well as the percentage of allocable ODA spending screen using the disability dark marker in 2018. So last year, um, to really raise awareness about the disability dark marker and see how the EU use it in more details, we produce a new report. And then I say we is, is, is always in collaboration with the great polymix. Uh, that we can guide us uh, and has so much knowledge about the dark marker. So uh, we focus on analyzing the spending of the European Commission on disability inclusion uh, in global action from 2018 to, to, uh, to 2020. Of course, we, we use the, the policy marker. Um, the findings that we have is that the EC rapidly adopted the dark marker. So that was great. They use it for all of their project um, in, you know, in, in, in humanitarian action and international development. But then um, the share of ODA project giving a positive marker score has been increasing, but was still quite low actually. So in 2020, some 80% uh, Eighty-four percent of the applicable project still did not target the inclusion of persons with disability in any significant way. Um, so, disability inclusion was not the principal objective, and it was also not reflected in um, 
uh, the gender equality um, project. Uh, one last point I'd like to make um, is that this disability uh, marker, it's great, but it will need to be improved further. For instance, in the European Commission, we have different directorate general on humanitarian, on external diplomacy, on international cooperation, on the neighborhood, and then we cannot distinguish um, which directorate general is using um, the marker better. So if it's more project uh, to advance the rights of persons with disabilities. So what we're going to do at EDF, our commitment is to continue to monitor the use of the DAC disability marker within the European Commission. And what we would like to do uh, is to make sure that the EU, when it's working with other uh, cooperation agency and providing funding like um, Germany and Belgium, etc. We want to make sure that they also use the dark marker when working with the other um, technical cooperation agencies. Something we're going to follow up this year. Thank you. What's going to be uh, faster, I think, uh, because the interventions are shorter. So thank you, um, uh, Marianne, for making that uh, important point uh, that you are going to be monitoring uh, the, the role of EC as well as EU, because e EU is one of the major funders for these projects across the, uh, across the developing world. So it's very, very crucial that you make, make sure that they remain accountable and they utilize the marker. And thanks for asking the question in the end about the, uh, the, how this marker uh, could be interpreted across different directorates. So it's good to track that. Uh, now from Marianne, Steph, we'll move to Mary Kyo. Uh, she is uh, Advocacy Director at CBM Global. Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kega. Um, hello, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here with you today, um, calling in from Dublin, Ireland. Um, just to do a quick presentation about myself, similar to Marion, I won't be naming my age, but just to say I, I feel as much energy as Marion also. Um, and I am a wheelchair user. It's probably not obvious in the camera. Um, I am enjoying the Irish spring weather, which is still not warmed up just yet. So I'm wearing a blue scarf and a, a warm cardigan. So, yeah. So I'd like to, I'm going to speak a bit differently around the DAC marker, um, not from an analytical point of view, but more to a project that we've been working on um, over the past year with a number of organisations of persons with disabilities and with the wonderful Polly Meeks, who's been our guide through the whole process. So basically, the project is entitled Why the OECD DAC Disability Marker Can Be a Powerful Advocacy Tool for Organisations of Persons with Disabilities. Next slide, please. So our starting point with this project was really thinking about evidence-based advocacy and how we could work with OPDs um, to look at how to develop really strong evidence-based advocacy, particularly around development um, assistance. So our assumption for the action research project was if OPDs gain skills on accessing and analyzing the DAC database, the analysis that will come forward from this will be grounded with the knowledge and expertise OPDs can bring. And I think Marianne just spoke there earlier and other colleagues around how, you know, clarifying what significance means and principle means from a disability rights perspective. We're told it's an innovative research project and the first of its kind to be undertaken on the OECD DAC disability marker. And I think primarily because this was really led in, in the issue of process, um, again, very much guided by Polly. So thank you, Polly, for all of your work. Next slide, please. So first of all, the why behind the project. As a federation, CBM Global has an advocacy priority of improved data for increased accountability. And this is very much about how we work with OPDs. And the project's main objective was to highlight the very wide range of ways in which disability marker data and other marker data can be a useful tool for advocates across the disability movement, particularly OPDs and organizations engage in advocacy at national level in the global south. So while as an INGO, it was of interest to us to look at the, the data, what was really of interest was to look at this with OPDs and particularly OPDs in the global south. Next slide, please. So just to explain through the, the how of the project, 
And um, what we did was the project has run over a year. We started off with a series of skills development webinars on the disability development marker. A survey was then, and they were widely opened to um, our OPD partners and to also our country teams. A survey was then circulated teams within CBM Global and also to our disability partners to see what type of priority areas that they would like to investigate. And then an action research project commenced. And basically five action research teams were formed and the research began. And this research happened over the summer of last year and into the last quarter of 2022. Polly was there to give guidance and advice the whole way through the project. And what has come out of the project is six case studies produced, looking at the DAC marker sectorally, looking at it from a donor government perspective, and also government where development assistance was provided. So we had a real mixture of teams, five teams, um, primarily OPDs leading a number of the teams, and looking at this also from a, very much from a global south perspective. So next slide, please. So the, we haven't published the report just yet um, because we're just in the final stages of it. And because it was an iterative process, we're, we're, we're back and forth checking and making sure everybody is happy before we publish. Um, but the idea is that the case studies will be able to be standalone case studies that can be used by OPDs in their own advocacy, in their own content, in their own context. And what we found from the collaboration um, is that there's been an increased recognition among OPDs and partners on the benefits of using the, DAS, the disability DAC marker for evidence-based advocacy. The skills and confidence in using the DAC database for analysis on disability inclusion has increased. The individual case studies, as I spoke about, they can be used uh, by OPDs in their own advocacy context. We will have an overall report which will gather everything together, and we will also have our own our own thinking in terms of the process that we engage in. And lastly, the forthcoming publication, as I said, will be available um, midsummer. So thank you for your attention, and apologies for running a small bit over time. Thank you, Mary, for uh, taking a deep dive, or like a, not a deep dive. <laughs> into the project insights which you shared uh, from CBM, very, very crucial to have these reports uh, uh, published. Uh, and also you mentioned about evidence-based uh, uh, advocacy. Um, I'm glad that you underscored that because that will be covered in the next uh, uh, session as well, because there'll be speakers will be talking or touching about that idea about how this marker is crucial for evidence-based advocacy work. Thank you for underscoring that. And now from idyllic Iceland, we take a virtual trip down to Nigeria, where we have a, a fellow um, independent consultant, um, Dr. Adebukola Adebayo. Uh, he is from the Disability Rights Movement Nigeria, and he has been affiliated with the World Bank. So Dr. Adebukola Adebayo, the floor is yours. You have five minutes. Okay, uh, if you can hear me, thank you, Gagan, for the introduction. Um, I am happy to be on this panel, and my name is Adi Bukola from Nigeria. I'm of the Nigeria Association of the Blind, and uh, also do a lot of independent consultancies. Uh, well, I'm putting on a very colorful local fabric, uh, uh, made up of so many colors, blue, purple, <laughs> pink, and so on. So, uh, of course, uh, I'm happy to be here again. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna speak to is that, um, Sometime last year in September, where with support from the World Bank, uh, FCDO and Site Savers, uh, I facilitated the establishment of uh, Nigeria Partnership for Disability Inclusive Development, which comprises um, multilateral, bilateral organizations, international development organizations, um, OPDs, organizations of people with disabilities, uh, relevant government ministries and agencies, uh, and so on. And so the, uh, at the launch of that uh, forum, the executive secretary of the Nigeria uh, Disability Commission uh, requested that uh, development organizations working in Nigeria should increase disability inclusion in their projects by at least a minimum of 10%. You know, and that request uh, was not based on any um, facts, any data, because there was none in Nigeria at that point in time. 
Um, secondly, uh, recently I just concluded the research and analysis of uh, disability inclusion in ODA to Nigeria in, from five countries, namely Australia, France, Germany, uh, Sweden, and the uh, UK. And um, from that uh, findings, we observed that, uh, first, firstly, that uh, people with disabilities, uh, organizations of persons with disabilities in Nigeria have no, have never used the uh, OECD DAC disability marker to analyze ODA to Nigeria. And of course, they have not used it in any form of advocacy before now. Again, the, um, the findings of this uh, research that we did, I did here in Nigeria, um, showed that um, um, up to 80, up to 80% 80 of uh, total ODA flow into Nigeria from these five countries um, record the blank in the dark marker scale. That is, they do not inc indicate whether they uh, have disability inclusion or not. And um, and for those that um, uh, those that are not left blank, those that uh, have some disability inclusion, uh, up to 49% of those uh, have just zero in the disability marker. And uh, in, in all, just less than, um, um, basically in the scale marker two, just about, uh, it's just about uh, less than 0.2%. You know, so you can see that uh, according to the findings that we have, uh, uh, disability inclusion in OECD uh, ODA flow to Nigeria is extremely uh, low, and it's very difficult to trace uh, disability inclusion in most of them because they, they are even uh, mostly blank. And so, um, what uh, do we want to do with these findings here in Nigeria? Um, we want to. Um, engage stakeholders, including OECD member states here in Nigeria and other international development partners. We want to engage them. I will be facilitating uh, this in two ways. First is to build capacity. And uh, to do this, we will first sensitize OPDs about the existence of the disability that, uh, marker, that disability marker too. And of course, uh, we'll identify and train um, focal persons with disabilities on how to use the uh, dark marker, uh, disability marker here in Nigeria. And then on the advocacy end, we will then come back to engage the Nigeria Partnership for Disability Inclusive Development, where we have many uh, development partners as members, and we'll be engaging them um, through advocacy. So I'm told my time is up and uh, uh, let me just stop. But for, for, for what we will do basically is to engage OECD member states in Nigeria and we'll do this on annual on annual basis. Thank you. Thank you so very much, um, Adebe Kolo. Uh, it was very nice to hear your voice and uh, your insights uh, from Nigeria. It's very crucial that uh, uh, the marker gets uh, implemented and as you said that you were able to use the marker to, uh, to find uh, uh, the possibilities. Uh, but there, where are the pitfalls and how you could do that because you work in Nigeria based on the markers insight. So thank you for that. Now straight to the UK, uh, we will listen to the uh, head of policy and development uh, from Side Savers, Hannah Lorriman. Hannah, insights please. Thank you. Thank you very much um, and, and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, it, I've been working on the marker for a number of years and so it's really exciting to hear so many people engaging with it and talking about the marker. Um, and, and that that engagement really increasing. Um, I think a lot of, of what I would uh, like to say has already been said, so I'm just gonna comment on a few things. I think um, one thing that is perhaps coming up across some of the interventions from different people is the that the DAC marker has use across a different a number of areas. And for me, there's a question of it being great for breadth and scale and also for depth. And so I think it's useful to see it in that in that kind of way, because what it gives us, those headline figures that Polly mentioned at the beginning in terms of, it shows us that there is a really headline issue with the amount of, 
ODA, which is spent on disability inclusion, especially when you take into account that those those figures that seem quite shocking, actually, the, the amounts are probably potentially a lot smaller. So it gives us that hard, le high level data that appeals to different audiences. And so that can be used with politicians, it can be used with um, different people who perhaps don't respond to some of the other data that we might have, or some of the kind of more qualitative information that as a sector, we might have more. And then I think what it also gives um, for many of us is, a, is an element of depth. And so although the numbers themselves may seem quite top line, actually looking into that data and really seeing kind of what does it really say and, and how does that relate to areas that we might know very well because they're countries that we work on, what are the, what are the anomalies within that data? So is there a country that's doing very well? Um, but it has different departments within it. And actually you can look at the data and, and as Mario mentioned, that's difficult to do for the EU, but it is possible to do for other countries. So is there discrepancies and what does that tell us about where advocacy need, needs to be targeted? And then I think um, the other thing I really wanted to reflect on is that a lot of the important questions that are being asked about the DAC market and about use of the market today are actually questions for us as a sector more broadly in terms of what are we trying to achieve on disability inclusion. So um, one which I've uh, uh, people have heard me talk about before, apologies, is the thinking about that number of principal, principally marked data and is what do we want to achieve with that as a sector? What do we think that donors should be marking? How many, what percentage of programmes should be kind of disability specific programmes? in the kind of twin track mainstreaming approach. You know, what, what do we think that um, levels should be? What should they be progressing towards in terms of um, significant programmes? What does that look like? What's that kind of, what are we looking at when we're taking it from something that's relatively low to something that's relatively high and what's that trajectory? And then the question around um, kind of what does significant look like in terms of marking programmes? I think is actually also a question of what does significant look like in terms of disability inclusive development programs? Is there a kind of agreed um, amount of spend? Is there agreed steps? And I think lots of us would have lots of ideas about that, but actually how do we pull that together and how do we use what we're seeing from the marker data to, to make more informed decisions around kind of what we want to achieve for disability inclusion going beyond those kind of top level policies, which we're now seeing in place. And then very quickly, I just wanted to talk about um, some work that Sightsavers is, is in the process of doing. I'm going to share my screen. If it doesn't work, then um, hopefully that's working. Uh, so one of the things that we're really interested in is people using the data. And as others have said, it, that's sometimes not, not the easiest thing. Can anyone see my screen? Yes, I can. Thank you. Yeah, you can see the, the data. Um, great. So what we're trying to do is think of ways of making that more accessible to all of you. So we're in the process of developing this visualization. And what is on the screen at the moment is the percentage of programs marked. Um, and it will be an interactive tool that people can use to click through um, all of the countries that are using the marker. Um, see trends over time. Um, so what I've got at the moment is the percentage marked and by clicking through the years, you can quite clearly see the increase in marked programs, but there's also ways of seeing disability inclusion, um, the percentage of programs, seeing the comparison between the gender marker and, and other things like that. So that will be available hopefully soon. Um, and we'd really like people's feedback on that. And um, we want to try and make sure that, uh, that it's accessible, that it's useful, and that it kind of provides you the, with the data that you'd like. So I, I, we will share that widely um, when it's available. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Hannah, for, uh, for taking us through the program uh, with regards to what Sightsavers is doing. And also when you were mentioning in the end about this infographic, that's, that's really, that reminded me of uh, uh, the late with Hans Rosling and his organization, uh, Gapminder, which has amazing infographics like that, which helps uh, uh, makes the data more digestible, more understandable and more interpretable. And uh, that, that, that increases the utility of the data even more. So thanks, and we're looking forward to engage with that uh, when it gets launched. Uh, and now we have reached to the end of the first half, the first phase of this um, uh, seminar. 
Uh, we have heard from different speakers and uh, there are a lot of questions which have been asked, Hannah asked also many questions and a few of these questions will be uh, addressed in the upcoming presentations. Uh, but before we uh, go into that, uh, let's take a, a 10 minutes break uh, where we could uh, have some refreshments and uh, we resume back in 10 minutes for the digital audience. And for the digital audience who is there, uh, if you have any questions thus far, please write that in the Q&A box and uh, we would try to address them as best as we can in the end of the uh, session because the Q&A bo box will be closed at 2 p.m. CET. Thank you. To uh, those who are present in person uh, in Oslo, get, get a chance to stretch your legs, uh, grab some refreshments. Uh, and uh, since time is of essence and we have such exciting uh, group of speakers still left to hear from, and then, uh, and then a thought-provoking panel discussion subsequently. Uh, it'll be wonderful if all of you could settle down and uh, welcome back to all the digital audience members as well. Uh, hope you found the first half of this event uh, thought-provoking uh, and insightful. Um, and now we will transition to the next phase uh, and we will begin with uh, our veteran uh, uh, speaker, Anika Nilsson. Anika has uh, worked in this domain of international development and focused on disability inclusion for many, many years, both pre the OECD DAC marker and post the OECD DAC marker. So Anika, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I am a, a lady. <laughs> Very young hearted, <laughs> but a little bit old, but I refuse to be retired with gray hair, hair and a turquoise um, jacket. And I will uh, talk about uh, my experience of uh, analyzing the Norwegian aid in 2011 and uh, now in uh, two years ago. Uh, uh, after the market had been introduced. And uh, first of all, I will say that uh, I think that the market has such a potential uh, to serve as an uh, accountability tool uh, because uh, donors and the governments, they are making so many promises in their laws and policies. They don't give any money. So you want to look at, at, at this as an advocacy tool. And we have already heard that there are both advocates and governments that already are starting to use it. If it should be a good tool, it needs to address some of the challenges that we found when we used that marker in real life and did some quality assurance. So um, uh, I will move from my first uh, introductory slide, which shows uh, a, a drawing of a person in a wheelchair trying to reach the support, uh, but it can't be reached because uh, there's many stairs. So next slide, please. So the first problem we had when we tried to quality assure the marker was to define disability. Even uh, you are saying that the targeted in, or the uh, principal initiatives might be easy to define, but not always. Uh, we found many projects that we couldn't really know. For example, uh, cataract surgery, curing blindness, operating one eye. For example, we had the um, surgery uh, of cleft palate uh, issues that reduce disability. Mine victim surgery, very expensive Norwegian projects for a long time. Also, for veterans, uh, this might be uh, in Ukraine now, will be a lot of costs for rehabilitation, uh, physical and psychological, and uh, should we code it as a disability? Oh. Mental health pro uh, programs were the most difficult to know uh, how to categorize them if they were disability or, or health pro programs. Also, victims of uh, fe female genital mutilation, uh, those fistal surgeries, mm -hmm. uh, uh, actually uh, helping women uh, out of disability, and nobody considered to call them with the disability market. So, uh, the first challenge uh, we need more uh, guidance on definitions of disability. The next slide. Uh, it will come back to uh, the question that everybody has faced. 
<laughs> what is significant? Okay, so when we interview the uh, program directors about significance, they were humble people running large uh, regional programs. They said, oh, yes, we have a disability in Lebanon, we have VAH in Syria, but on the total, we, we couldn't say it's significant. And then you had another organization saying, oh, but now we have a new policy. Disability is going to be one of our main objectives. And then when you looked at the programs, nobody had done anything. So uh, <laughs> it was coded significant. So we coded and decoded and discussed about significance. Also, a program can have a significant focus, but have no outcomes or impact. So we are not looking at impact, we're just looking at intention and we have seen so many promises. So my question here is, uh, should there be some sort of outcome or sustainability criteria to use the market? Uh, should there be at least a budget percentage? Because you can have a huge transport or inclusive education project. Uh, only 1% is going to disability, but it's significant because it was the policy that we paid for or something like that. So uh, should there be a budget percentage requirement? Uh, also, should there be an OPD participation requirement in line with uh, the CRPD provisions? So uh, my suggestion is that we need to do something about this significance. And also, I heard from UNICEF that you have a marginal marker. I would have liked to see a marker um, that was talking about marginal or emerging disability focus, because what do you do with all those good intentions or new cameras that have not reached significant level? They are doing something. They should be recognized. So maybe a discussion with UNICEF about a third level marker. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another pro pro problem which we have not discussed, in the guidelines, uh, there is a provision that if a project is segregated, it should not be considered as disability inclusive. So we have to decode all the payments to institution building, for example, and things like that. Uh, but it's very difficult to know where is the borderline between uh, a good uh, targeted initiative that is uh, supporting persons with disabilities and when does it become a not desired segregated <laughs> initiative. We have so many examples, for example, of parent organizations starting daycare centers for their children. Should we decode all of that? Uh, we need to discuss what is a, a good targeted and when does it become undesirable segregation. And that is not clear in the guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think we are overestimating all those uh, percentages that have been presented today. Uh, and the, the reason is we are not agreeing what is the total aid. You have heard that we have mostly talked about the percentage of the allocable aid. So uh, if we count the total aid, also those uh, core supports to the multilaterals, the percentages will be much less. Uh, and in my uh, work for Norway, I have included all aid. That's why the percentages look smaller than the ones that Polly is calculating. Also, are we counting commitments or are we counting the actual disbursements uh, to disability? Uh, according to guidelines, uh, commitments have been used in some calculations. Uh, in my Norwegian studies, I've used the actual dis disbursements and the uh, uh, also, the coding can change over time. Finally, uh, are we counting numbers or disbursements? That uh, is a relevant question for those with a significant disability focus, because we don't really know how much of the total budget that is going to 
disability. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the issue of uh, counting numbers or budgets. Uh, numbers will be better to describe trends over time, but they cannot be used to compare countries between each other. Some countries uh, have codes for every small project, while other uh, countries have initiatives group like regional programs, country programs. So the numbers cannot be compared between countries, just within the same country. Uh, when you count disbursements, uh, comparison, can, comparison can be done between countries, mm -hmm. easy, but you never know exactly what is the percentage that was going to disability. So there are pros and cons about that. Okay, so finally, I want to echo Hannah who spoke before the break. Is it time to set targets now? If we first have to uh, address those challenges that I talked about. So I think it's time to have a target for principal and uh, significant uh, uh, disability focus so that we have an, a better advocacy to it. And the remaining programs that are not significant and not principal, at least, I think they should be forced to have a, a disability disaggregated target, at least one in the whole project, and one monitoring indicator on disability. Um, and uh, finally, I think there should be a separate budget for reasonable accommodation in every donor agency. Thank you. Thank you so very much, um, Annika, for a, being present here in person and uh, uh, giving a very clear, candid, and critical perspective on this whole idea about what is significant and how do you ensure that things are significant, and, and also underscoring that idea about what is a good targeted uh, uh, measure and what is the undesirable segregation that should we be supporting undesirables. If we support undesirable segregation, then that should not be considered as part of the visibility inclusive uh, that marker. So thank you for underscoring that. And we are very fortunate that Anika would be with us later on as well for the panel discussion. So that's wonderful. We could engage with her subsequently as well. So now on that note, we move from Norway in-person presentation to again back to the digital ether world. We take a trip uh, from Norway to the East Coast. Uh, um, uh, transatlantic flight virtually uh, to Jose Vieira, uh, the advocacy director at the International Disability Alliance. Jose will share his other perspectives on what the marker is, how it came into being, and what was the role of IDA in the whole business of making sure that the marker is aligned with the UNCRPD. Jose, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Gagan, <clears throat> and thank you, colleagues. Um, I hope my video and uh, lighting is correct. Um, otherwise, please uh, let me know and I will make sure to correct anything that needs to be uh, corrected. Um, in any case, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Atlas and, uh, and all the people um, joining today, both virtually and in person, for um, organizing um, a webinar on a topic that I think um, it, it has been important um, all of us have uh, tried to contribute in different ways to ensure that the dark marker really becomes an effective tool for organization of persons with disabilities, for government and for other stakeholders. But looking into the future, I think the dark marker should be seen as a, as a powerful tool to ensure that um, one thing um, happens and hopefully happens in the near future. And that is um, how can we transition from political commitments to uh, real, and uh, we shouldn't be afraid of calling this financial um, commitments, a, an investment, right? So um, I, would, I would just like to share with the audience few thoughts um, as we have um, in Ida, participated in the initial uh, work around the creation and uh, implementation of the dark marker, but also um, from the perspective of uh, sharing with uh, colleagues from CBM Global 
and many others uh, in the disability community, a, a recent uh, exercise which was to produce a report around the dark marker and how uh, it can be used for organization of persons with disabilities. And the first thing to say is that um, organization of persons with disabilities in general, um, I believe that we are um, transitioning uh, from a period where our advocacy was uh, very much focused maybe on the most urgent uh, uh, topics. And we were doing advocacy based on what we carried um, historically as a toolkit for advocacy. So it is clear that uh, over the last uh, 10 years, it has been a shift from uh, not just uh, uh, advocating for more inclusion in education, for more inclusion in employment, um, kind of, you know, to, to, to push the door to be open for persons with disabilities. But now that shift from pushing the door to being inside the room um, means another new challenge for the disability community. And that is once we are in the room, what we want to say and what are the evidence and, and data that we can collect in order for us, once we are in the room, to raise our voice, to bring our perspective from a more scientific evidence-based uh, advocacy approach. And I think the dark marker is that tool together with many others that will enable us more and more, not only to push doors to be opened for the disability community, but once we are in, and when we talk about education, when we talk about employment, when we talk about climate action, food security, uh, and any other topic, we first analyze what we need, but also we analyze what other stakeholders and in particular governments are doing concretely for the implementation of this convention on the right of person with disabilities. Ida in general, and not only about the dark marker, but through other tools like the GLAD community of donors, the Global Disability Summit, which was recently uh, hosted by Norway, and, uh, and Atlas and, and Ghana um, have shown that we really need to create more tools that will support the implementation of the Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities by objectively assessing what governments are doing and what governments should be doing in terms of disability inclusion. The next thing that I would like to say is that when we realize the importance of this shift from, uh, as I like to call, advocacy based on belief to advocacy based on evidence and data, the big question remains, one, what needs to happen within the organization of persons with disabilities um, infrastructure for us to be better prepared and better equipped to advocate in this new uh, framework? And B, what is the role of organization of person with disabilities in this new framework, more based on evidence, data, and an and objective uh, advocacy, if we wanna call it that way. The first thing is that we really need to see a further investment, even the dark market can help us in assessing that investment in how we can bring advocacy tools to organization of person with disability, especially those working um, in, in, in countries where the dark marker um, is, is, is applied about how to advocate for whole governments accountable to use the dark marker. So for many organizations of persons with disabilities, when we talk about the dark marker, the natural first reaction is we have one more thing to deal with. But if we dig in a little bit further and we realize that the dark marker is not an end, but a mean for pushing on advocacy, uh, on education, on employment, on social protection, et cetera, et cetera. The dark marker becomes part of what, what I like to call this toolkit, this new toolkit that OPD should have that includes dark marker, that includes data, that includes um, the, the, the participation in the SDGs, that includes uh, many other tools that will, in the end, help organization of persons with disabilities 
to further implement the Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities, especially at the local level. The second point that I was uh, making uh, just, just a minute ago was, what is the role of organization of persons with disabilities? And we will all agree that more and more, what happens at the global level needs to be translated into real action to uh, the national level. So I think we need to continue unpacking the different roles that all organizations of persons with disabilities, whether they are region, regional, national, or international, can have. But in, particularly, in particular, what is the role that IDA, for instance, as a global platform of persons with disabilities, can have at the global level to promote within the UN system, the use of the dark marker, to ensure that partners like CBM Global, Atlas, and many others um, start investing in understanding and, and promoting the use of the dark marker. And of course, in the international spaces, how governments should do more around the dark marker. And second, and now I would say that it's uh, even more crucial, is the role that national organization of persons with disabilities can play. And here, I would say that um, although in general, we focus a lot on the global South, I think this is, a, this is an issue that is a, a global issue for all. So organization of persons with disabilities, both in the North and in the South should um, join forces, should be uh, including the dark marker in their projects, should include uh, the dark market as a tool to measure the success of projects, the success of investment. And I think, um, there is, there, is, there is one uh, common understanding that our heart of, 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 of the advocacy work is the CRPD implementation. But now we are better equipped with different tools to ensure that that implementation is more effective, is more in line with the CRPD standards and organization of persons with disabilities are in the center of this implementation. In summary, I would say that from the perspective of organization of persons with disabilities, we have somehow successfully engaged at the global level to advocate for a dark marker, for having more understanding about the dark marker. Now it's time to put in the hands of organization of persons with disability, especially those working at the national level, this tool for them to hold governments accountable, to promote the further implementation of the CRPD at the local level in the best way possible. IDA is committed to continuing working at the, at the global level, but we can, we can do this only by strengthening partnerships with, uh, with people in this room to ensure that the dark marker is not longer a long Excel sheet that many of us have trouble accessing it, but rather a tool to go to the Ministry of Health, Employment, uh, social protection, international cooperation, et cetera, et cetera, and say, there is a tool, there is an instrument, you should do more in order to have better and more investment on disability inclusion. Thank you very much. Jose, for uh, reminding us that uh, when we look at or we understand OECD DAC marker, we don't have to view it as, a, as an end, but it, it's a means to an end and it's a means which will help us in our advocacy efforts in gathering greater momentum, uh, forging partnerships and implementing projects which are aligned with the UNCRPD. That's such an important and powerful message. So thank you for bringing that home uh, in your presentation. And you'll also join us in the, in the panel. So that's, we're looking forward for that uh, interaction subsequently. So before we uh, talk about the panel, we have two other presentations. So, uh, the first one is going to be from, uh, from Denmark, uh, Ina Lekke Jensen. She's a senior advisor of DPOD, Disabled People's Organization Denmark. Uh, and uh, there will be, since we are based in Norway, there'll be a lot to learn from Ina's insight. So Ina, I hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Chaka. I hope you can all hear me. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so briefly, I'm a, uh, a white female, mid-age, with a green jacket, long hair, blue eyes, and I'm talking today to you from Roskilde in Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, so for everybody to understand uh, uh, the organization I come from, just very brief, briefly, Disabled People's Organization Denmark is the national umbrella organization of organizations of persons with disabilities in Denmark. So 
at the same time as acting uh, nationally in Denmark, we also uh, are engaged in, in, in international development cooperation in partnerships with a range of national OPDs and umbrella OPDs in the global south. All of this with funding from our Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs as part of the Danish ODA. Um, and uh, yeah, supplementing this in the last uh, decade or so, we have increasingly taken on the role also of advocating and seeking influence on Danish development aid as a whole for, for it to become more disability inclusive. Uh, and in relation with the DAC marker, uh, we have been uh, having talks with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, prior, for the first time, uh, prior to the adoption of the marker. Uh, and Denmark has supported uh, the marker and confirmed from the beginning as well that they will be reporting on it, uh, even though it's voluntary. Um, so the Danish reporting on it uh, started only in 2020. Um, yeah, so for us at the Disabled People's Organization Denmark to support uh, our advocacy aim, uh, we see uh, two potential uses of the data from the disability marker. And the one is uh, to add value to, uh, to our advocacy and, and uh, tracking and monitoring of disability inclusion across Danish ODA. and, and um, and this, the second potential role we see is uh, to engage with our uh, OPD partners in the Global South on, on sharing our learnings and, uh, and uh, yeah, engage in, in equipping uh, our partners uh, to use the, the, the marker as well. The, the, this last part we have not uh, come to yet, but this is an aim aim we have. Uh, so what we've done until now is that we have uh, looked into the two data sets on Danish ODA uh, on the disability marker, which is the 2020 uh, data and the 2021 uh, data. We've also, uh, we are also engaged in the CBM global research that uh, Mary Kjok told us about earlier. Uh, through through that, uh, we have uh, learned a lot as well um, in terms of of uh, getting more perspective of the data that we uh, we have uh, analyzed ourselves. Uh, so, in terms of the data, uh, well, as it has been shared in a few of the slides, I think Hannah shared a slide and Polly as well, where you could see that that Denmark is actually reporting on approximately 90% of the allocable uh, aid. Uh, but uh, in 2022, it was about 4.5% of, of the allocable aid that had a, a principal or significant objective. Uh, this number actually fell uh, quite uh, relatively a lot. Uh, for 2021, it's only 1.5% of the allocable aid that uh, has uh, objectives uh, of disability inclusion. So what we, we did was to uh, dive into those uh, commitments, the, uh, each of the single commitments to see whether we could find any data on uh, that documented uh, the extent of disability inclusions and, and documented what the basis for the the marking was, and uh, and that was really difficult to find. Uh, in many uh, cases, uh, yeah, we couldn't find anything that uh, had uh, that described disability. Um, some in some cases, which we thought was actually interesting, even if you had both a gender and a disability marker in the same project, you in the evidence from our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there was a lot of this description on the gender um, angle of the project or, or objective, but uh, you couldn't find uh, anything similar uh, regarding the, the disability objectives. So, um, so, so that, uh, yeah, that was our approach to it, to actually dive in and see if we could find documentation. Um, yeah, so, 
on basis of that, we've had uh, we've engaged and are continuously engaging with our Ministry of Foreign Affairs on uh, the marker, and we will uh, continue to do that and and uh, and aim to have a more uh, thorough dialogue because we also have a lot of of questions arising from these uh, deep dives. Uh, also, we would like to understand the, the process in the ministry of, of uh, scoring, to which extent the handbook is used, what internal processes there may be. Also understanding the drop uh, from 2020 to 21, understanding any uh, targets that might be in disability inclusion, how these uh, numbers are used internally within the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, if they are. So there is a lot of potential questions uh, uh, to ask and, and uh, talks to have. And, and um, just to kind of round up, so our intention uh, here would be both to engage in a dialogue about the quality as, as has been raised before, to ensure that when we see the, 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 the data that we can also uh, see the documentation and that, that the documentation has a certain quality in terms of, of, uh, of the projects actually having a, a true and, and uh, a, an approach that is aligned with the CRPD, the Convention of the uh, Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, but of course, we also want to see an increase in the in the amount of Danish development aid that is disability inclusive. Uh, yeah, so I think I will stop there. I thank you, Ina, for uh, bringing that conversation closer to Norway because uh, uh, what Jose was also mentioning that uh, that using this OECD DAC marker as a tool to open doors mm -hmm. and uh, you are able to open doors uh, for the, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Denmark and uh, are able to uh, quote unquote uh, place their feet closer to the fire uh, mm -hmm. uh, and make them accountable. That's very, very good. Uh, and I hope other countries can learn from that template of utilizing the marker. Uh, now, uh, from Ina in Denmark, we'll go to another uh, wonderful organization, European Network for Independent Living, and Lilia Angelo is, is with us. She's a project officer there. Uh, Lilia, would you like to share your thoughts, please? Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I will talk about a study on the quality and reliability of disability marker score. So um, at the end of last year, uh, Ina uh, worked on a pilot study on the quality of reporting choosing the marker. It was part of the larger study um, conducted by Polly Mix uh, for CBN that was mentioned uh, earlier. Since uh, you know, the European Network on Independent Living is a, a organization, European organization of uh, working at European Union level uh, organization of um, with members. Uh, uh, disabled people and organizations of disabled people. So we focused on the uh, European Union. Uh, we tried to look at project, we wanted to look at project reported as disability inclusive and analyze whether the score adequately reflects the project's engagement with, engagement with disability inclusion. So we wanted to look at projects marked with score one or two. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. We, um, I will talk about the challenges uh, we encountered and the recommendations. Um, the challenges are absolutely in line with what's been mentioned uh, so far. We face two main challenges. One is related to the design of the marker, and uh, the other was uh, related to the availability of the information. Next slide, please. Uh, with regard to the design of the marker, as you all know, uh, the, the assessment criteria used are very brief and general. Uh, if you compare it with the uh, uh, gender uh, marker, uh, the slide, this is what the slide shows, a comparison between the disability marker and the gender marker um, for score one. Well, disability marker has basically one sentence stating that disability inclusion is an important and deliberate objective. Uh, while the, this, uh, the gender marker is much more detailed, in addition to this, there are five uh, criteria starting uh, from the uh, uh, 
gender analysis, going through activities to monitoring and uh, evaluation. So what's the problem with this very gender uh, general um, criteria uh, used? One problem is, problem is, of course, that it allows for significant variations in the uh, interpretation of the scoring. But another problem, which is uh, equally important, uh, is that because the, the tool, the marker, is not only an assessment, uh, an evaluation tool, it's also a prescriptive tool. So it tells us what we need to do in order to have a, an inclusive project. So um, it fosters learning. So having it too general uh, and not specific does not allow donors to understand really and uh, follow uh, and, and implement uh, in, inclusion. So how did we try to address this in our study, this too general um, focus of the marker? is that we designed a checklist drawing on the OECD guidance for the disability marker, but also for the gender marker, and also recommendations by different disability organizations. So this checklist will be presented in the report by uh, CVM, uh, which will be published later, as I was told. So the other challenge that I mentioned earlier, in addition to the design of the marker, is the, the, the quality of the information available. So we wanted to find information about individual projects. And we looked uh, at the U8 Explorer database and the International Aid Transpar Transparency Initiative database, the portal. Uh, what we found out is that the information, there was very limited information. So we, there was information about the total amount, um, the uh, one sentence about the project uh, goal, the participants in the project, but uh, that was all. It was not enough to be able to judge uh, the, whether the, the, the project really contributed to inclusion. We tried to address this challenge by looking at alternative sources of information, such as the websites of the EU delegations uh, or the Capacity for Development website. Uh, but still, the information was too limited to allow us to, uh, to make uh, meaningful conclusions. Next slide, please. So based on our experience uh, from this study, uh, we formulated uh, two main recommendations, which are again uh, in, in line with uh, what quite a few of the previous speaker has uh, said. To the EU, we recommend uh, to make, um, to improve transparency by making uh, information about individual projects uh, publicly available. It would be also useful to have uh, information about the justification for the specific score. And to the OECD, uh, we uh, recommend to strengthen the design of the marker by, by adding additional, uh, additional criteria. Uh, can you click again on the slide, please? And um, I would like to, to, to highlight to that uh, poorly designed and implemented uh, marker can actually do more harm uh, than good as it can uh, sustain the, basically the, the status quo uh, projects that are not disability inclusive, inclusive can be presented as uh, disability inclusive. And it is also linked to what um, Annika highlighted uh, before. Uh, with regard to the implementation of the marker and design, having a better design is important, not sufficient. It's important also to uh, train and provide support uh, to staff who will be using the marker so that they know uh, what is uh, inclusion and what is not. So this difference between uh, integration, uh, inclusion and segregation you know, has been looking as an organization has been working a lot on the institutionalization. And we have found that often uh, projects that uh, contribute to the proliferation of institutionalization, but in smaller settings are pre presented as uh, inclusive, um, which is questionable from the point of view of the convention. And um, just uh, to conclude, uh, the guidance for um, CRPD committees, general comments and guidance can be useful uh, in, in 
supporting a better understanding of what exactly is uh, inclusion and how to implement projects in line with the convention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lilia, for that uh, important uh, intervention and uh, reminding us about the risks uh, associated with the uh, OECD DAC marker, uh, where it could be interpreted quite generously, perhaps by some uh, by some organizations, and uh, and it might distort the picture. Uh, and uh, that's very very crucial uh, to mention, as well as with the opportunities which are there associated with the marker that helps us to ground. Uh, our uh, understanding of the marker even more uh, closely. So uh, now we have, uh, uh, if you are with us, hopefully you are all, all with us. After all these uh, erudite, uh, insightful presentations from across the globe, uh, we would now uh, want to indulge into a, a panel discussion and a Q&A uh, session. Uh, we have received a few questions uh, from the digital audience, and uh, we'll have th four panelists who will be joining us digitally. Uh, some of some of you, uh, some of them you might have heard already, uh, like Polly Mix, who started kickstarted the proceedings, Jose Vieira from Ida, uh, as well as Ragnar Lokmil from uh, Nurad. But uh, there's one additional panelist uh, whom you have not heard from from yet. Uh, it's Mina Mochtehadi. Mina is an independent consultant uh, and she's previously uh, worked in the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but for this event she will be talking as an independent consultant and sharing her insights uh, on this, uh, on different topics which we'll cover. So yeah, we are looking forward for the panel discussion now. Uh, first, I would like to uh, invite uh, Marit Sonheim, our executive director at the Atlas Alliance, to uh, make a short comment and ask a question which helps to kickstart the discussion. Marit, please. Thank you very much, Daga. First of all, I'd like to thank you, uh, Polly, for a very interesting and insightful report and uh, to all our speakers today for uh, uh, for uh, all your uh, thought-provoking and, and very interesting and insightful remarks. Uh, I think we learned something new for from every one of you, and that's quite impressive given the number of speakers that we've had. Uh, so thank you so much to all of you. Uh, meaningful involvement of persons with disabilities and OBDs um, is uh, one of the three strategic areas in Norway's strategy for inclusion of persons with disabilities in uh, development cooperation, very much in line with the provisions of the CRPD. And um, it actually refers to OPDs as key partners in development, development work, which is very important. And we see that also very clearly from NURAD's work and from our cooperation uh, with NURAD, that this is something that is um, one of the key uh, drivers of their uh, work on inclusion that we are very happy about. And um, uh, from what we've discussed today, um, everything from uh, it, it comes really out from many of the several of the speakers that um, that the uh, the the general uh, nature of the disability marker is a, a great challenge, and we hear that from uh, from Ragnar from Murad who. Uh, we also stated that the, the disability mark criteria are less clear uh, than the uh, gender marker criteria, and that the, several of, of the other speakers have also, uh, also alluded to that. Um, so what I'd like to, to ask you about um, was um, uh, when it comes to consultation with OPDs as an additional scoring criterion that several of you have, have mentioned, and that's also mentioned in the report. Um, it has obvious uh, advantages. Um, I think we can all see that very clearly. But what um, I wanted to ask you, are there any dilemmas, any challenges? How do we measure? How do we make sure uh, that uh, the um, involvement of OPDs or persons with disabilities in development work is actually meaningful? How do we define that? Um, so what I'd like to hear from you is really um, what challenges do you see 
and what uh, do we need to be mindful of if we introduce, if uh, OECD Act should introduce involvement of uh, OPDs as an additional criterion. Thank you, Marit, for uh, your uh, insightful comment, as well as uh, your, your question about um, involving this OPDs uh, meaningfully and what is meaningful. So uh, without any disrespect, I would like to go to the digital uh, participants first, uh, Anika. Uh, Jose, uh, would you like to take on, uh, take on uh, Marit's question about what is meaningful? How do we ensure that uh, meaningful participation uh, of OPDs takes place when it comes to framing the marker or implementing the marker? Yeah. Thank you, Gagan. Thank you. <clears throat> um, this, this can apply to the dark marker for sure, but, but in general, I think um, when we talk about meaningful participation and, and, uh, and consultation, of a of person with disabilities through their representative organizations. Um, I think uh, we, we, can, uh, we can talk a lot, but few concrete recommendations or few uh, lessons learned so far that by the way, uh, as part of the GDS 2022, um, where one of the main objective was meaningful participation, uh, many organizations, including Ida and, and colleagues from Atlas, um, have developed good tools that are available in different websites. I'm sure in the Atlas website, in the GDS website, around um, OPD engagement and OPD participation. But I think the first thing that we need to say is that um, we really need to ensure that a wide representation of organizations of persons with disabilities um, are at the table, right? Um, we tend to sometimes, uh, and, and not, with, not with bad intention, but sometimes we tend to oversimplify representation. So we think that um, those who are more active, those who usually participate are the one that we need um, in order to uh, assign or to define a process uh, meaningfully participatory. And it's uh, kind of the opposite. We should make sure that all of them, including the active ones, but those who are most uh, marginalized, those that need further support, those that need um, different elements um, in terms of accessibility, in terms of reasonable accommodation, um, can participate because that is that is meaningful participation. And that also creates ownership, something that we learned um, over the years. And, uh, and, and again, the GDS 2022, since it's a very recent uh, example, but an example that is very close to, um, to Norway and to many uh, people in this room <clears throat> has, has shown us is that by consultation, we create ownership. Um, if you want to ensure that something uh, it's owned by the people, you sh we should all do our efforts to ensure that people feel included right, right, right from the beginning. Um, another thing that I would like to say is when, when we talk about meaningful participation, I think it's critical even more in this DAC marker process that we are all uh, on board to ensure that the participation really starts uh, from, from the beginning. Uh, in the design, in the implementation, and the monitoring. I think uh, um, we can not only conceive participation as a way of, this is the tool we have created already, we have done this, uh, go and use it. No, the participation should be uh, right from the beginning. And in particular, and, um, and I, I don't know if we still have Polly on, on, online, but something when we were doing this uh, report uh, together with uh, Polly and colleagues from CBM Global, it was amazing, at least from my experience as a, as a blind person, to see the accessibility barriers that supposed the access to the information around the dark marker. So imagine if we apply those uh, barriers to other disability groups, a like person with intellectual disability, person with psychosocial disability, um, and what it means for them uh, not being able to access uh, that information. So I think meaningful participation should be conceived from the minute zero throughout the whole process and ensuring that everyone, including those most marginalized groups um, are included throughout the process and in the different roles that we can all play as person with disabilities, but even more importantly, through our representative organizations. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jose, uh, for pointing that out. Uh, I'll go straight to Polly. Polly, you uh, in the report uh, talk a little bit about this uh, topic about uh, meaningful uh, participation and consultation. Uh, would you like to share a few words? Thanks very much. Well, Jose is much better qualified than I am to talk about what really effective meaningful participation should look like. But I think all I would do is to, to reiterate what he said, that there is a lot of thinking that's already gone into this. And that even if it is challenging to get it right, I think it's really essential that this should be added to the criteria for the marker, because otherwise we end up with a situation where we're effectively implying that a project can be disability inclusive, whilst at the same time not necessarily involving meaningful participation of persons with disabilities, which is really completely contradictory under the CRPD. So I think um, definitely address the criteria. And then there is a wealth of expertise on how to how to do it really well once once we've got it in there. Thank you, Polly, for that. Uh, uh, Ragnit, would you like to share a brief comment and uh, map it or, because uh, Marit uh, mentioned about the equality for all uh, strategy yeah. and, and you also touched upon it in your presentation. So this yeah. meaning participation aspect. Thank you. Yeah. No, it, it is a very valid point that it's, it's something that kind of comes apparent in your face when you try to apply this criteria, uh, this disability market that it's, it's not included today, given its importance in, in, in CRPD. It's, it's like, it, it's core important. Um, so your question, Marit, is which challenges you see if involvement of OPDs is to be included as additional criteria for using the marker? And I, as a user of the marker, as a grant management, I see that if it's put, and it, I agree that it should be put, but if, if it's put, it must be very clearly defined. Uh, for the users, for grant managers, what it would mean, what what uh, participation mean, because it, it goes from being <clears throat> consulted, I mean, sharing an a document with an OPD to having an OPD taking a leader seat in implementation of a project. So you have a big scale of what, what uh, inclusion consultation of OPDs um, really can look like. So I think um, defining it well uh, is key for it to be able to be applied uh, in a coherent way. Thank you. Thank you, Ragnar. Uh, you're absolutely uh, spot on. Uh, when it comes to uh, this consultation, it, there's, there's a ladder and at the bottom rung is information sharing and in the top is joint decision making. So I think we have to climb that ladder. Uh, yeah, so that's true. Uh, uh, Anika, now to you because they, because Ragnu mentioned about how to define my thoughts are how to define meaningful participation or consultation. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are that uh, first of all, uh, just compare uh, if we had a gender program without involving women meaningfully, we would uh, uh, think that was impossible. So yeah, I want to draw that uh, comparison. Yeah. Uh, but defining, it's, uh, it's not an easy thing because sometimes the disability uh, itself makes it difficult for some people to uh, understand or participate. So you have to invest a lot in preparing uh, such meaningful participation. And if we don't have the time, which uh, we often don't have, everything is going to be so rushed mm -hmm. and we don't have the money, to uh, build capacity, then uh, there is a very risk of just tokenism yes. and ticking mm -hmm. a box. Yes. So uh, I see that if, if we are not ready to set aside money and time and effort, uh, we will just blah, blah, talk. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you for that candid point. And I think this aspect about uh, ticking the box uh, problem was also mentioned by that in his presentation. So that's a valid problem. Mina, a final word to you about this before we move to other topic. Yeah, thanks, Gagan. I, I've worked uh, in many kinds of organizations um, with different kinds of disability data, including the marker. So in multilaterals, I've worked in organizations of persons with disabilities, and then more recently in the government. And uh, some of the, the speakers in their presentations referred to something that I wanted to raise is that the, the marker is just one tool amongst all different kinds of tools that we can use to track progress. And to keep in mind that the objective is ultimately 
to ensure that persons with disabilities are accessing their rights and benefiting from development cooperation and humanitarian assistance, just like everybody else. So in, in that sense, um, you know, uh, the, the question about uh, including um, participation of persons with disabilities in the doc marker as a kind of a criteria, uh, I think, I mean, Giorgio is better <laughs> positioned to address this than I, but when you change the criteria of the data, it means that it won't be comparable with, with the previous data. So it's some, there needs to be a discussion at, at what point is this introduced? Um, and there's a very interesting question in the in the q and I don't know if Kagan, you were going to go to that later, but um, on that significantly level, like what criteria is enough to be called significant? And maybe we can come back to that later. I think participation has to be included there at the very minimum. But um, but uh, there was a, I think it was Ragnil, you, meant, you showed the comparison with the gender marker. So at the moment, the, the disability marker uh, the screened level doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't give us any information. Um, in the gender, the equivalent in the gender market requires that you've done a gender analysis that informs uh, whether or how to not do harm in the, in the proposed program or project. And that might be a place to uh, put in uh, meaningful participation of persons with disabilities, that analysis being conducted maybe with representative organizations or persons with disabilities being uh, meaningfully consulted. I mean, again, consulted is not meaning, meaningful participation, but it's one entry point. Um, but we don't have to wait for the dark marker to include this as a criteria. All organizations uh, that they're tracking progress on disability inclusive program can set their criteria for what uh, um, for tracking progress um, on disability inclusive programming in line with the CRPD. Thanks. So thank you uh, so much, Amina, for that uh, insight. Uh, and also uh, thank you for priming because you almost uh, uh, read my mind. Uh, this question about significance and how significant is significant, you know, that was going to be asked uh, now. Absolutely, because we are talking about the questions of definition. They're asking, we are, we're talking about what kind of challenges are there with regards to interpretation, and there might be a possibility when there'll be over generous interpretation or very strict, rigid interpretation. So let, let me throw it out straight to Anika. Anika, you mentioned in your presentation about significant uh, objective. Would you like to untangle that or perhaps define it more clear, clearly? Think, think out loud with us. Yes. Okay, so I suggested in my presentation that particip meaningful participation could be one criteria. Another one could be at, at least to have uh, related to some outcome, not only to uh, the intention as you talked about, but that it's really leading to an outcome so that at least there should be uh, uh, outcome. Of course, that can only be recorded afterwards. So, uh, but it's a one idea that it should be linked to a, some real action. <laughs> and the, the, the third idea was that at least to have a minimum percentage of the money. I mean, it, it cannot be inclusive if it's uh, one percent, it should be some percent of the total. Uh, uh, so those are just ideas uh, to to bring it uh, forward. Um, uh, but I'm uh, curious to know if others have uh, yeah. what more about that as well. Absolutely, uh, we could circle back to uh, Mina. Mina, do you have any thoughts about uh, this significant objective? Because that's the one which is a little bit more gray. Principle is a little bit more clear. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to add something to that. Yeah, thanks, Gargan. Uh, this is a, a question that I, I've really considered a lot. And, and um, I mean, uh, ultimately, uh, how I understand significance is that, you know, that the, the disability or the, the program is completely inclusive for persons with disabilities. Um, I, I don't think we can settle for any less. I think the problem with setting criteria within this marker is that we're setting a bar for what is like the minimum? What is, what, what is it that uh, a donor needs to achieve in order to be able to set it? But what we want to aim for is fully inclusive programming. And that doesn't necessarily have to have um, 
the principal objective. It can be a significant objective. And then the other problem with this marker is that you might have a fully and well mainstreamed disability inclusion mainstreamed program, and it won't necessarily meet the criteria for a significant objective. I mean, but again, this is another issue with the, the significant objective or the marker is that um, it's not very clear, like, does it have to have kind of an explicit objective, like written out, uh, you know, and, the, and then you have the programs that have activities, but that's not significant enough to re re reach significant. Um, let's say you have a fully mainstreamed disability inclusive, let's say WASH program, um, but there is no objective written out. It's just that in every aspect of the program, accessibility has been taken into account, participation of persons with disabilities, and they're kind of at the activity level without explicitly stating that there's an objective uh, that persons with disabilities have, you know, equal access to, uh, to WASH uh, services and WASH facilities. Um, and I think that the, the market doesn't capture mainstreamed, fully mainstream programs or mainstream programs very well. And the other thing with this is that um, a, the spending also, uh, it's extremely difficult to calculate from a mainstream program. And we also don't always need money to ensure that persons with disabilities are included. So uh, I, don't, I don't have a very good answer for what are good criteria for a significant. I think there are more problems uh, than there are answers. Uh, and we have to keep in mind what the ultimate objective is. Yeah, no, thank you for uh, for mentioning that. Uh, and it's good to kind of um, think out loud together uh, because by doing that, uh, we kind of come a little bit closer uh, to understanding of the problem. I just wanted to re respond to that explicit objective. Uh, I think it's really necessary uh, because if you are not uh, explicitly uh, saying how you are going to include persons with disabilities and reporting on how you have done it and what was the result, there will be no mainstreaming. Mm -hmm. And from my experience of so many organizations that claim in their policy that everything they do is mainstream. Yes, it's very easy to say that and to code themselves as principal in everything they do, mm -hmm. but in reality, this is not happening. And that is even going for inclusive education programs uh, that when you come to visit the schools, mm -hmm. children are not there, despite it being even the principal objective. So uh, I, I don't think we, we should let go of the objectives and the and the uh, indicators. Yes, yes, oh, absolutely, I agree. Uh, Holly, would you like to share a few points uh, uh, what Annika was mentioning? Um, first, just to say I really agreed with what Mina said, um, that um, we shouldn't settle for anything less than a project really being effectively inclusive, full stop. So um, I guess any criteria is sort of at best a, a proxy for that. Um, and I don't have the perfect answer to this. Um, we the best attempt that, that, that I've been involved in was the, 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 was the work that um, Lily mentioned in her presentation where we were trying to come up with a sort of more detailed checklist of some of the criteria that we would expect to see in a disability significant project to try to fill in some of the, of the biggest, um, biggest gaps or uncertainties um, in, in the um, disability marker guidance. But I think um, we'd recognize that's just a first step and really there, there's sort of a, a, a bigger exercise and a big part of that exercise as other speakers have mentioned today is um, building the capacity of, of staff more widely across agencies so that they really understand what a disability inclusive project would be in, in different contexts. And although the markers have great incentive to help them do that in a way, there's, there's no shortcut to actually doing the, the capacity building um, sort of a bit further upstream as well. Thank you, Polly, for that uh, insight. I think, Jose, you mentioned briefly about capacity building. You want to share a thought or two about that? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I, I agree with uh, all what has been said already, um, in particular with regards to, sorry, um, I, I had my camera off, apologies for that. Um, I was just saying that, first of all, I agree with all what has been said, um, and in particular with regards to 
the project should be inclusive. And uh, but I think when when uh, when we talk about uh, inclus inclusion or how to make project inclusive, um, we we should also try to measure. And and I know that we should have a we, we should be realistic of what we want to achieve. How and um, and what are the parameters or criteria that we want to um, incorporate that we believe are needed to um, strengthen the use and the and the impact of the of the dark marker. Um, but I think a capacity building as a way in which we can measure how better OPDs are equipped to undertake any kind of work. Um, and in connection with this, I would say, the the concept of organization of persons with disabilities as equal partners for for development are elements that we should uh, that we should consider. However, I, I would really like to emphasize something that has been said um, by some colleagues here is that we really need to be realistic. I think we have a marker that, of course, can be um, better developed, can be further developed. It need it need more thing. But I would say that from the disability community, what we now need is to start using the dark marker more to ensure that governments use it more to ensure that um, we start measuring investment uh, and project uh, or disability inclusion by the dark marker. Um, and then I'm sure we will have time to, to further think how to strengthen the, the market. But what we need now, and maybe um, just in, in, in connection to one of my first point is that we need to transform political commitments into real financial uh, commitments. And the DAC marker was meant for that. It is for that. And it should be used in, in that sense, at least around the, 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 the themes or the areas that we now have available. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, for that insight. I think uh, this uh, debate uh, will continue because uh, uh, whether to make this marker as realistic uh, so that it opens doors and uh, acts as a way for advocacy or to go and have the most perfect ideal marker, uh, which has clear definitions, clear indicators, and uh, and which might be hard to build consensus around, perhaps. But that's, that's a different deeper debate, but we have time is running out. A quick question from the or digital audience. Uh, Camilla, would you like to read that, please? Yeah, there was one that came in uh, a little while ago that says, uh, how can the marker be applied in project development in cases where the donor does not require it? In this case, how would this feed into the overall database or is the marker only for national governments? Uh, Rangan, would you want to take a bite at that apple? <laughs> Can you break down the question for me, Camila? It, uh... Yeah, so how can the marker be applied in project development in cases where the donor does not require it? In this case, how would this feed into the overall database? Uh, and then there's a, the extra question saying, or is the marker only for national governments? I think for project development, the, the marker do contribute to uh, create awareness and change this can be used in that way to change um, attitudes and create awareness on disability uh, inclusion in, in, in programming. And I think that is maybe one way it, it could be applied in, in, in program uh, development. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll give that question to somebody else too, if, if anyone would like to try to, to, to uh, go at it. Thanks, Ragan, for this. Anika, you want to have a quick... Uh, quick... Yes, I, I think the... Coding is done by the government. Yeah. So uh, the donor itself, sometimes it is done by the partners of the donors, and then you have a better chance of uh, influencing because you can insist on the, your pro program maybe to be marked. But uh, in the end, it's the donor who sends this uh, statistics, uh, uh, and the government sends the statistics to OCD. Thank you, uh, Annika, for that. But one brief question, wherein I would want you to have like one sentence intervention, if possible. 2030 is seven years from now. We are five years into this OECD DAC marker. What kind of conversation would you think we would be having in 2030 around this marker and its use and its implementation? Wally, we can start with you. Thanks very much. Um, so two very quick things um, on the 
supply side of the data. Um, I'd like the marker to be both as rigorously um, specified and as rigorously applied as possible. And on the demand side, I'd like um, as many organisations of persons with disabilities um, to be actively part of this conversation, able to access the data and able to use it for accountability as possible. Okay, we go to Mina in the meantime. Mina, what do you think about that? In 2030, what conversation will you be having about this marker? It's a really tough question. I've been racking my brain on what, what I could answer. Um, I think that at the moment, we're really uh, talking about uh, getting uh, donors to report against the marker and increasing that. So I hope that in the future, um, our focus can be more on the quality. I hope that everybody is already reporting against it. And we're talking about how well the marker captures the quality. It came up in many presentations today. I just want to maybe refer a little bit to inclusive education, for example. Um, one of the speakers mentioned that the marker may be used to mark program that is promoting maybe not the CRPD aligned uh, inclusive programming, but rather, you know, education for persons with disabilities, which might be segregated or integrated. Um, so I hope that that's the focus will no longer be on having everybody report against it, but actually on how do we uh, improve the quality of programming through the marker. Thank you so very much. Annika, one sentence. Uh, yes, I think that the major gaps have been addressed by them and that uh, it is used in the same way as the gender market, that we are reached that stage. It's yeah. as natural as the yes. gender market. Yes. I think we will be there. Wonderful, thank you. That, that's optimistic. And uh, uh, one quick intervention from Giorgio before we let the panel go. But Giorgio, you want to say something? Yes, uh, I want to say something, uh, and I also agree uh, what just been said that this can reach the same level of reporting and influence, I would say, of the gender mm -hmm. marker. What I would like to leave you, I mean, I, I had many questions we, we, I couldn't address now, but there is one, uh, one point I would like to raise, that uh, all these very, very interesting um, considerations on data quality, on additional criteria, on what is uh, significant in the context of the disability market. I mean, we have to find a way to bring uh, this discussion also back in the OECD. And I'm also talking, the OECD discussions are, are members driven. So uh, there are, of course, uh, some, some uh, uh, moments of discussions with the CSOs that are quite uh, quite generic normally, um, and but otherwise it's it's member driven what is uh, what is happening at OSD. So I'm also uh, uh, looking at the members that are here in the room at Norway and UK and others uh, on uh, how they can bring all these consideration back to where the decisions on the on yes. the shape of the marker and on the quality of the data are taken. And of course, I mean, the Secretariat is very happy to work on this if members uh, discuss and decide that, that yeah. gives us a mandate to, to further work on this. I mean, we can make, of course, little adjustment to the things, to, to, to these handbooks and things. We can make little adjustment. That's not a, a problem, but if we want to, uh, rise the the bar. We have to find a way to 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 bring back uh, together members uh, and uh, and uh, uh, civil society organization in in an OECD uh, style dialogue. That's what I think. Yeah, thank you so very much, uh, Giorgio, for your intervention. Uh, please put your hands together for the panelists. Uh, I would like to express a note of gratitude to all the participants who joined digitally for this event, as well as those who came on uh, in person. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here. And what uh, uh, Giorgio was mentioning in the end, that we would want to uh, push this uh, information, push this dialogue uh, at the highest levels possible. So we start the conversation here and we take it to OECD. Uh, and it's important that now you have understood more or less so what the marker is, how it's, uh, uh, what are the pitfalls linked to the marker, what are the possibilities with the marker. And also, if you want to know more about the marker, please uh, visit Atlas Alliance website, report section, and check out the 
report which Polymix has written for us, as well as the handbook which Giorgio was mentioning in the, in the presentation. And uh, what Anika mentioned uh, in the end, on an optimistic note, we hope that in 2030, we would have a different conversation when we would applaud the success of the marker and the normalization of the marker, like the gender marker is for us. So thank you all. Thanks to the sign language interpreters and thanks to uh, the Atlas colleagues for making this event possible. Thank you.